my life or our lives as human beings are 100% dependent on nature. It's crazy how much it affects us, but how much people don't recognize it and realize what it actually is. Human beings are the biggest causes of climate change. But the good thing is there's a solution and we are part of the solution. It's very, very important to continue encouraging our governments and ourselves that the environment is not really an issue for tomorrow. The environment is every day issue. It's the air we breathe, it's the water we drink, it's the food we eat. And we can't live without The people things. of the member states of the Caribbean community, CARICOM, are no strangers to natural disasters and even social disruptions that can interrupt their lives. The world is losing the battle against climate change. And that's going to affect the way me and you live in a very, very big way. And the damage and loss assessment for climate risk management. I'm supposed to run? Oh, important that the youth of nations engage in the critical debates of society because they bring the energy, they bring the new ideas, they bring the new way of looking at There's things. There's a responsibility there. that's unique to our generation that previous generations didn't necessarily feel. What we hope that climate justice can achieve is for young persons to be able to have the power to cope and adapt to the crisis that we are in. there was a need to bring young people into conservation. So that at least our future generation, um, so that they can see what we are enjoying now. The sense of urgency I think is really hard to find and I'm hoping that that sense of urgency can come forward before it's too late. This earth that we have now, you know, there's no planet B, there's no other place we can go to. We've got to preserve what we've got and take care of it. It is absolutely critical that youth engage in the debate over conservation. We wanted to get involved in a solution. I started out small and at my own home by trying to limit electricity usage because electricity production is the largest emitter of greenhouse gases. But for me, turning off the lights more often or unplugging electronics wasn't enough. I wanted a source of clean, renewable energy powering my home. Less more action has an impact on the world. You have to look at the bigger picture and not be scared by if your friends aren't doing it and they're making fun of you because it's gonna impact you. Hi, good afternoon to everyone, and welcome to the National Parks um, Authority Awareness Month. And today, welcome specifically to the virtual roundtable discussion. And uh, my name is Hayden Belinji, and I'll be your moderator for today. Now, the theme for today's virtual talk is the future of conservation engaging the next generation of environmental champions. And of course, I had to put that video together to give us sort of a sense of our responsibility to pass on this indelibly important responsibility to our youths who are the future of conservation in the region and the world. And the objectives for today's virtual talk are bring attention to various governmental and non-governmental agencies that are integrally involved in the sustainable management, protection, and conservation of the environment, and to explore strategies to engage and educate young individuals in conservation initiatives, and also to inspire, mobilize, and foster dialogue on empowering the next generation to lead in environmental sustainability efforts and to groom future environmental champions and advocate. 
Thank you for choosing to join this virtual talk. And I'm sure that you'll be inspired because we have a pantheon of professionals who would be presenting today. And I'm looking forward to have your questions and your comments on our live stream so that we can be engaging and be able to get your answers, um, your questions answered, sorry. And I want to remind our presenters that we have an audience who is open to learning. Let us be as succinct as possible. You were given seven minutes to present. Please use those seven minutes wisely. And so we might have some time for questions and answers. Thank you so very much. And first up to present, we have Ms. Sania Compton. And Sania represents the Caribbean Regional Fisheries Mechanism. And she will be speaking on the topic. Let me have the technology um, do its work. Speaking on the fisheries sector, impact, current trends, and future projections on the sustainability of the fisheries sector for food security, etc. Please make welcome Miss Sanya Compton. We seem to be having some technical issues. Um, Sania, are you there? I am here. Okay, please go ahead. Oh, so you're able to hear me now? Yes, we can hear you. Okay, great. I had the mic open earlier, but um, I guess you could hear me then. So good afternoon. And thank you for the, the introduction. So as Mr. Belinji stated, my name is Sanya Compton and I am a consultant with the Caribbean Regional Fisheries Mechanism. So on behalf of the CRFM, I would like to extend to the National Parks Authority of St. Vincent and the Grenadines a, a gratitude for inviting the Secretariat um, to this discussion and to present on today's timely and relevant topic, which is the future of conservation, engaging the next generation of champions. I did not put together a PowerPoint presentation. I didn't know if that was the protocol here, but I did make a few notes and some key points that I would like to share in my allotted five to seven minutes. For those of you who may be less aware, the CRFM is a specialized CARICOM institution that was established in 2002 by the CARICOM heads of state. And it started its operations a year later in 2003 and it's headquartered in Belize. And there's a regional office right here in St. Vincent. And the CRFM consists of 17 member states, 14 of which are small island, independent small island developing states with three British overseas territories. And of course, St. Vincent the Grenadines is a member state to the CRFM. The main goal of the CRFM is to promote the sustainable use of living marine resources and other aquatic resources through the development, efficient management and conservation of such resources. And a key focus of the organization is on small scale fisheries and aquaculture. Fisheries and aquaculture play an important role in trade, employment, and food security in the Caribbean region. Many coastal communities depend on fisheries for their livelihood since the fisheries sector provides jobs and contributes to poverty alleviation in these coastal communities. It's estimated that up to 64,000 people are directly employed in small-scale fisheries and aquaculture in Caricom countries. In St. Vincent and the Grenadines, there are quite a few fishing communities from as far north as coastal communities in Oria and Chateaubille to those in Barley, Kingstown, Calico, as well as within the Grenadine Islands of Beckley, Canawan, Union Island, and Myro. And the CRFM works alongside its member states to provide support for the sustainable development and conservation 
of the country's fisheries and aquaculture resources. Now, the third strategic plan of the CRFM specifically speaks to areas of conservation. Strategic Goal 1, Objective 1.1c, speaks to conservation and management of key fisheries, resources, and ecosystems in order to ensure sustainable use of the resources and protection of critical habitats and ecosystems such as seagrass beds, coral reefs, and mangroves. Strategic Goal 2, Objective 2.2a, addresses the strengthening of national fisherfolk administrations, fisher, fisheries organizations, and any other civil society group or institutional framework to collaborate and participate actively to promote small-scale fisheries interests in fisheries management and conservation processes at the local, national, and regional levels. Our economies, our marine ecosystems, which includes fisheries and aquaculture, as well as our coastal communities have been adversely impacted. And we saw some of those impacts highlighted in that video. And these impacts are usually external shocks related to climate change, related to economic development and environmental degradation, global market dynamics, and pandemics, such as the one recently presented by COVID-19. In the Caribbean, especially in small island states such as St. Vincent and the Grenadines, we are all stakeholders. What are we if not big ocean states, small land masses surrounded by a large expanse of ocean. It is therefore within our best interest as individuals, as a country, and as a Caribbean people to become better stewards of our marine resources. The work of the CRFM seeks to enhance efforts related to sustainable food development, food and sustainable development, food and nutrition and security, and to improve awareness and understanding of the role of its member states in resource mobilization and in finding new ways to make the organization be confidently expressed and visible to have more donors and international development organizations partner to find effective solutions for the utilization and mitigation, utilization of our resources and mitigation of impacts. The goal here is to achieve balance within our societies and it's also for the development of our marine resources such that conservation and management can be both beneficial and effective. I would like to end and close off by saying that the CRFM is now celebrating this year its 20th year anniversary. 20 years of vital contributions to fisheries and aquaculture in regional and national economies, as well as 20 years of vital contribution to food and nutrition security, livelihoods, job, job creation, trade, and blue economic growth. So if you ever want to find out more information on the CRFM, we are on social media, on Facebook, on LinkedIn, as well as our very own website, which would be www.crfm.int. Thank you so much for the time, and I look forward to this afternoon's discussions. Thank you so very much, Sania. That was very insightful, and thank you for being obedient to the time allocation. You did very well. Thank you so much. Um, I am looking to see if there are any comments on your presentation, but if not, um, let me ask a few questions just to get the ball rolling. Um, you spoke about um, the objective of sustainability of the fisheries sector and the food nutrition and food security, but that obviously has its um, underpinnings that is linked to the youth and how they're involved in a sector. Fisheries have not been one of the sectors that have really seen young people getting involved. What strategies does CRFM have to look at sort of including youth in this vital sector? 
Thanks for that question. And it is a poignant observation that fisheries um, is not necessarily, well, it's not usually the choice that a lot of young people make to get into the fishery sector. It's actually quite a lucrative sector um, in terms of just investing in fisheries and the actual money that you can make from it. So just putting that out there. But in terms of the way that the CRFM, you know, collaborates or supports its member states in looking at um, the development of or the engagement of young people in the sector itself is through a lot of the trainings that it offers to its member states through the fisheries division. They can perhaps speak more to that when it's um, their time to be engaged. But a lot of the training, we su provide support through a lot of the training programs throughout the Caribbean for the fishery sector. Where there's a need, we try to address it. Once a need is identified, whether it be it through the fisheries division, whether it be it through um, the National Fish and Folk Organization, of which we do have one here in St. Vincent, and the, the president, actually, um, Mr. Winsford Harry, he is quite the young person himself. Um, and he, I wish he was. I wish he was part of this panel because he can certainly tell you um, about his experience. It is quite a great story he has to be told. But yes, to, to cut cut to the chase, we provide support through a lot of our training programs and initiatives. And I would have I highlighted um, that the strategic plan that we have 2.2 in the strategic goal we have in our strategic plan speaks to providing that sort of support through our um, through the fisher, fisheries administrations and organizations as well as civil society groups and a lot of these civil society groups throughout the region and in St. Vincent and the Grenadines specifically do use these resources to engage young people so it's really just to build awareness at that local as well as national level for youths to be engaged. Mr. Belenji, sorry, if you can hear me, I can no longer hear you. Oh, I'm so sorry. I'm so sorry. Yes, thank you, Sanja. Um, that was very insightful. Um, for persons who have joined the live, welcome. And please share the live so that we can have more persons coming on to this discussion. Also, please leave your comments, your questions, so we can be a bit more engaging so that you would find this to be of great use to you. Thank you, San Tanja, and all the very best. Thank you. Great. Awesome. So we have heard from CRFM. And at this moment, I'm going to um, bring on a very important lady. Her name is Rodica Tanis, and she is currently, let me find her designation. She is with the National Parks Authority, currently the Deputy Director, and she'll be speaking on sustainable management, protection, and conservation of parks, recreation sites, and conserved area. Please make welcome Ms. Rudy Katanis. Thank you, Aidan, for moderating our webinar today and for having such an enlightening discussion. So it's October and we are commemorating another year of awareness at National Parks, Rivers and Beaches Authority. And we hope that more persons are now aware of the authority or mandate and the contribution we have made to the environment, particularly as it relates to conservation of natural resources. As most persons may know, we are a statutory body under the Ministry of Tourism, Civil Aviation and Culture and we are governed by the National Parks Act of 2001, amended in 2010. Just to give you some back information um, about some background information about national parks, between 2007 and 2009, the St. Vincent and the Grandin's Tourism Development Project saw the development and enhancement of 14 parks and recreation sites across St. Vincent. 
Later in 2010, the Cabinet approval of the SVG National Parks and Protected Areas System Plan gave direction and scope to the work needed within protected areas, the engagement of stakeholders and the necessary actions needed at both an institutional and legislative level. We have undertaken many projects over the years, get at research and collection of baseline data, conservation interventions, as well as building capacity through training to better manage parks and protected areas. A few of those milestone projects include the work accomplished with support from the Caribbean Aquaterrestrial Project, which focused on the South Coast Marine Conservation Area. We have contributed to the creation of the SVG Conservation Trust Fund, which was formally established on the formally established on the Companies Act in 2016. Now, this fund provides for long-term and sustainable grant financing to support management of parks and protected areas and conservation of biodiversity. Then we had the implementation of the Marine Turtle Conservation Program through grant funding from the SVG Environment Fund in collaboration with the Fisheries Division in 2017. This project promoted conservation of marine turtles and associated livelihoods in support of a government ban on harvesting turtles. We have also utilized various avenues to reach the public and to engage the relevant stakeholders in the conservation of the environment. We have our school programs, our cleanup activities, as well as the printed and digital media. As most persons are aware, we have a vibrant social media presence. However, the impact of natural disasters over the last few years, compounded with the effects of climate change, has exposed the vulnerability of our protected areas. It is therefore necessary that we increase our efforts to protect and conserve our rich natural heritage. We are aware that the size and diversity of our protected areas in St. Vincent and the Grenadines requires more than a single institution. Hence, we need to continue to develop and maintain relationships with other agencies and stakeholders, both public and private, and form partnership with our communities. But there are greater connections to be made for the sustainable conservation of the environment. The next stage of our journey involves what we are doing today, fostering advocacy and stewardship by engaging the next generation of environmental champions. Thank you very much, Ms. Dennis. Um, I am always fascinated by the notion of building capacity across the community-based um, organizations. Um, how has the uptake of the younger people in these sort of um, initiative and capacity building drives? Well, we have seen increase in participation, especially at the school, with our school programs. Um, we have seen an increase in students wanting to participate in activities that we're doing. We have also seen with regards to our cleanup activities um, surrounding commemoration of environmental days where we get communities involved. And we're seeing that increased interest coming from younger persons. They'll reach out to us to find out, OK, what activities can we participate in? Or in some cases, they may ask for our support um, to guide the process, to let them know what things need to be done, which beaches may need cleaning, which streams may need cleaning, um, and also what other environmental activities that they can get into and contribute to. So we are seeing an increase in the interest coming from that younger generation um, to really get involved in environmental protection and especially conservation. Absolutely fantastic. Rudika, um, I have had the experience where persons came up to me and said, it's because of you why I studied environment. Have you had such um, testimonials after you would have done so many years of advocacy and education awareness about the environment? Well, unlike you, um, they have not been personal to me, <laughs> but so we I mean, have seen where persons are now. Mm -hmm. Yes. 
we have seen where persons are now more aware, especially the younger persons coming out of community college. Um, they were not aware of the career opportunities within conservation and protected area. And we are seeing that they are now more engaged. They are keen to have a career within that sector. And we hold setting turns. And at the beginning of each setting turn, um, we realize that the students, even though they may have studied some level of conservation, even though they may have some tourism background, when they actually get to a conservation agency and have worked for a year, they are now open to new possibilities. And they're always, you know, so and happy that they would have had the experience and that opportunity. Thank you very much. Uh, it is so important to do these sort of advocacy and awareness campaigns that allows persons to be aware as to what is what is possible within the environmental space. Thank you very much, Ms. Rodika. Tanis, that was very, very, very good. Awesome. So I wanted to shout out a few persons on the live. Ms. Um, Holly Bino, Alanson Cookshank, um, Naya Child, um, Danny George. How are you doing? And thank you for sticking with us. Please share the live and do not forget to leave your comments or your questions for our presenters. At this point, we would like to introduce our third speaker or presenter, and this is no other than Mr. Renal Mori. Um, he is an environmental consultant, and he'll be speaking on the topic biodiversity conservation in St. Vincent and the Grenadines. Please make welcome Dr. Mori. Thank you so very much, Aiden, and good afternoon to everyone. I am kind of running out of steam talking about biodiversity conservation and blowing this trumpet, hoping that people will dance or listen. But as we look around, as I look in my own area, what I want to do with you this afternoon, brief, my brief moment, is to share with you a couple of experiences I've had in my own area where I live and how it relates to biodiversity conservation, cognizant of the fact that we are point, we're looking at the future of conservation and we're trying to engage the next generation, we're trying to make champions or identify the environmental champions that exist. In the area where I live, when I came here, there were lots of iguana. I would come into my yard and find big iguanas running. I mean, I'm talking about large iguanas that fit against the gate and make it shake. I'm talking about walking into my porch and finding 10 inch long young iguanas in my porch. And I'm not living far from Kingston, by the way. I'm not living really in the forest per se. And these animals existed in my area. In this area, I'll see guys pass up early in the morning uh, with a bag and in an hour or so they'll come back with a large bag of what we call bush yams. When I was a little boy, those things weren't sold, but now you find them in the market at very high price. And so there is a demand for this and people are becoming cognizant of the fact that the word biodiversity or the phrase biodiversity, whichever you call it, is not a scientific thing that relates only to people in forestry or national parks or in some government agency, but it is the cornerstone of life. Biodiversity speaks to us about life, our living, all the food we eat, you know, the things we do, the, the, the lumber we cut, the, whatever it is, we, we depend totally on biodiversity for this. And it's unfortunate that our younger persons are not actually understanding the concept of conservation. So what am I saying? The, the season has just started uh, open up for the hunting of iguana, and thank God that there's a close season. But I see bands of young people, even little guys as old as eight and 10, running behind him with lots of dogs. And they just go and they catch everything. There is no protection for the younger animals. There's no constraint. Sometimes if they can't catch them, they just kill them because they're too small, they don't fit their purpose. And that is a shame. It really pains me to see that kind of action. You go into the bush just above me and it, you have to be careful, it's like a minefield, you're stepping into holes everywhere. Guys will go and will harvest the yams. And how much does it take to just put the head or the, the piece attached to the vine back into the hole and put a little earth in it? It won't take you a minute to do. But they'll come out with bags of yams. And the next year they're coming back. And now this year they're complaining, Doc, we ain't seeing no yams in the bush, man. The place is empty. But nobody ever took the time to put back those heads in the holes that they dug. The holes are already prepared. Just put the piece back, put the soil in it. None of that. You come to hunt, and as soon as the season opens, you take everything you catch. Iguana, manicu, bush yams. These were very 
common things in my area. People make a living by them. They still do, but now the, su the supply is dwindling very rapidly. And so the call is for us to take our education to the people who actually get involved. Yeah, I know we have the institutions that the Forestry Department, the National Parks and other entities, and we have these beautiful documents, you know, CFAM and all of these, but are we really targeting the people who are coming in? The guys who are coming in here, I don't know if any of them have seen or heard any of this information. So my suggestion here, my recommendation here is that we start targeting the children at school. All of these SBAs, we're writing all kinds of sophisticated things. I haven't seen an SBA. No one has come to me asking for assistance to put together an SBA that talks about preserving the yams in the bush. Nobody has come to me with an SBA talking about how can we conserve the iguana, how can we save them, or what's the problem we are seeing, what's the challenge. And I think that is where we need to start moving. Our education system needs to start moving in the direction of food security. How do you secure food based on I mean, using the concept of conservation. How can we ensure that there is iguana there for the next five years? How, the next, well, not five years, but for a period to come. How can we ensure that there's yams, there's iguana? And even things that we plant, we have gone to the this Monsanto's concept where we import all the seeds. And so the traditional things that we will have and we will grow and take the seeds from these and plant them back, corn and peas and even lettuce, that's out the window. And so conservation for us is just a, expression, not something that we practice. So my complaint and my challenge and my prayer here in this session today is that somebody will hear my voice and realize that, hey, we need to start talking to the people who are actually the hunters, people who are actually the harvesters of these yams, people who actually catch the crayfish out of the river. These are the ones we need to talk to because that's the food source that I see that is dis disappearing rapidly and one on which a large number of our people depend. So my plea and my call is to shift the emphasis there, I'm not saying that we should close up the documentation that we see in the school, but try and get the people involved in writing and studying and acting upon the things that concern life and livelihood in St. Vincent and the Grenadines. I know there's a time constraint, so I'm going to pause there and let the rest of it come to your questions. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Dr. Murray. And you read some, you read some very salient points. Um, I'm looking to see if there are any comments or questions on the live, but in as much as, as you, you've mentioned the issue of um, hunting of, of wildlife and there are no restrictions on size, what do you think are the proper steps to be taken to prevent this sort of um, situation and to engender a sense of sustainability where food is concerned but also where our, our wildlife is concerned? Okay, I want to suggest two things. The whole idea, we're talking food conservation, I mean food security. I think we need to put conservation on the table with food security, not separate it, not keeping it by itself, but that we put it on the table with food security. So in the idea of conservation, I think we need to get the people who are hunting. Probably there might be something where you, you start issuing license. It might sound ridiculous to the people who are going to hunt, but let them know if you're going to hunt, these are the conditions, not just open. I mean, I see a band of young men coming up here to catch iguana. I'm talking about little boys, 10, 12, and they're older ones, eh? they're older persons, they're persons in their 40s and stuff, but they have these little ones with them who probably do all the chasing, who climb the trees and shake out the iguana and stuff like that. These younger ones have no sense of what they're doing. They don't see the need to protect the small ones. And the older ones you think would have known that don't seem to be guiding them. So I am thinking there might be need to require that the people who are going to hunt get some kind of exposure to the need to conserve these things. That's one thing I was saying. And like I was saying, the SBAs probably now need to start talking about food security and iguana protection. Somebody need to do the SBA and iguana, the SBA and, uh, and uh, Manico, or the, the, the opposite, whatever you want to call it, the SBA and yams in the bushes. Those kinds of things is what my, my, my recommendation, my concerns are. Absolutely. And do you think we need to have a list of, of possible topics for SBAs that we can present to the Ministry of Education or to the principals of schools so that they can have a wide appreciation as to the topics that are quite possible within the environmental field. Oh, yeah, I do. I do. I really think so. I think the Ministry of Education should be tag teaming with the Ministry of Agriculture and with National Parks and all the agencies that are really doing work on the ground and set SBAs based on what is happening. Let it relate to life. I think that's one element that's missing in our education revolution. We're providing people, but they seem to be educated for foreign life. They're not educated to live in St. Vincent. They're not educated to deal with the challenges which we are facing. 
just food security. So yes, the list of topics for SBA should be prepared and it should be drawn from the things that are happening around us, the issues of life in St. Vincent. Absolutely. I'm going to um, challenge National Parks to start the movement to put this list together, um, looking at the different agencies and possibly coming up with this list and present it to the Ministry of Education. Um, there's a question from Holly. I'll attempt to read it. It says, food security is a main issue across the country. Felt really significant in the Grenadines since we are unproducing, not talking in our community, and not and now lands are being copped by foreign investors <laughs> and settlers. How can we protect our lands from sale, privatization, to be able to produce food and medicine? Uh, your voice has to be heard. I think the people have to make their voices heard. As much as we generally think that the policymakers are the people in, in, in the offices who we elect are the ones who make decisions, they don't. Because if you are putting them in office and you don't allow them to do it, they can't. If you sit back and let them do whatever they want, then they will do whatever they want. So if the community as a whole sees a need, you have a rep. Who is your rep? Your rep needs to be representing you. The rep isn't there just by a name or for a name. So whoever your rep is should know what your heart beat is, should feel the need. The rep should really be in the community to see the community, feel the community, hear the community, and speak for the community. And that's where you have to go. That's my suggestion. Thank you for that. And we have a few comments from our Facebook audience. Um, Lennox Hayden said, I like the point Dr. Murray raised, especially in the area of having the replanting of our local food so that we can have our own food so to speak, for our consumption. Dr. Murray, I have an interesting question I want to ask you. You talked about food security as it links to um, the bringing in of new and, 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 and um, exotic, species. Zonal, exotic species into our island. How important is the issue of seed banks in St. Vincent Grenadines? Well, unfortunately, the only that we have one, but that's a critical thing because now we depend almost entirely on foreign seeds. When I grew up as a little boy, there were no foreign seeds. In fact, I would plant lettuce and one will grow old and you take the seeds from that and plant it back and get good stuff. I'm not talking about little weenie thing. You get good sized stuff, right? But we have allowed all of that to wane away and now every seed has to be imported. And that is such a shame. Corn. I mean, why do we have to import corn seeds to plant when we, I mean, as a little boy, we are having bags. My grandparents grew up so in the dry season. You had a bag of dry corn, you grind it at the mill and you get grind corn and you live on that until the harvest start coming around again, dry corn and dry peas. But we don't see that. Our people are buying everything. So our food security becomes hinged on what the international people want us to have. And we have lost our sense. Our local or traditional um, cultivars have disappeared. We have let them go on. Go, let them go on. We are now depending on the foreign ones. Great. Absolutely fantastic. Um, reading some comments. I'll see how many I can get in during this session. Um, Allenson's Crookshank said, I once witnessed a young man cutting down an entire coconut tree to get a handful of coconuts. When I asked him where he will get the coconut from tomorrow, the day after that, he then realized where I was coming from. Hopefully, this lesson stayed with him. Funny enough, Aiden, I saw that right above my house, about 10 feet away from me, on somebody's private land. A young man came there and he looked at the coconut and instead of climbing tree, he cut the tree down. It was not his property, it was his place. I've seen that one myself. Wow. Crazy. Yes. So those kind of things, that kind of information we need to really echo in the heads of our children. Um, Charlie Juliet said, albeit we claim to be an agricultural-based nation, yet only a small percentage of schools offer such a critical subject on the curriculum. Any thoughts on that, Dr. Murray? Well, that that is important too, but the curriculum is not my biggest, you know. The bigger issue is how much of it really translates into reality. How much of it? Because they have some schools, for example, the Bishop's College, and I'm not I, highlighting them for any reason of personal thing. They have cooking garden and stuff, and the students go there and they talk about home garden. How many of them go home and, and look in the backyard? How many of them know if they have a backyard? So I want to see it translated, not just having more school garden. That is good, and I'm not saying that the person's point is relevant. Definitely, all of our schools should have some kind of um, garden or some kind of education on growing food, food garden. But I also want to see it not just something that they do in the classroom, but that is translated into home. So there has to be an emphasis where the home encourages that, where the adults in the home kind of help the children to translate that into real life. Absolutely. There have to be some practical. When I was a kid, I went to Overland Primary School and we had backyard, side yard, front yard, 
<laughs> and in between yard. We planted everything we ate at the school. So I grew up with this mentality that we must plant what we eat. And that is the only way we're going to have any sustainable sort of, um, whether it's food security or whether it fits um, you sustaining yourself as a small country. Um, Holly Bino said there are as many ancestral seed banks emerging in various regions globally. They are moving with anti-colonial, decolonial, decolonial values. It might benefit us from forming partnership with them as many of them are African, African focused. The, that is true. And there are some banks in the Caribbean, though I did a project for a country in the Caribbean, which I wouldn't name, that they actually have a seed bank and encourage people to go there for seeds. And it's not for um, important seed. They were trying to preserve the local cultivars. That's where I first actually saw a seed bank trying to preserve seeds of the plants that they had years ago that they, they, you reproduce and you select, you do your own selection. So you have a crop and you select the best seeds out of that crop and you put to the bank and people can go to the bank. A Caribbean island actually did that. I don't know how well it is going, but about eight years ago, I did a project for a Caribbean country that was doing exactly that. So I'm, a, I'm endorsing the person's comment. And I think we need to connect to other countries that have seed banks and start our own. There's still some cultivars that we can preserve here in St. Vincent that might be only be found the wrong here. We can still go salvage some things. Yeah. And if you look at our banana, for example, um, our traditional cultivar of banana is basically dead. I mean, yeah. you might find splotches of it here and there in different rural communities, but the new cultivar, the tissue culture has really decimated the old cultivar. And what it speaks to the responsibility of the ministries that are responsible for food security to look at um, creating and preserving these local cultivars. I don't know from my observation, I plant a few holes of bananas myself in a little space I have. And I've discovered that you take out the suckers from these 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 um the, the ones that are um, produced through tissue culture, and they don't readily transfer. They tend to wither away and die. In mm. the older ones, I remember we just dug out the sucker and you stick it anywhere it go. Yes. You don't do that with these. You have to give them special attention, special care. You have to note them or they don't make it. We still have though uh, people call it Trinidad banana, short banana, muggy or whatever you call it. The one that grows up in your backyard and you throw all the garbage around it and it grows. That one is still around, it's still bearing prolifically, but I don't that we are encouraging it because we have gone after the foreign ones. But I still have that one and that, I mean, it puts out some bunches that are taller than me. I'm telling you. And I can't eat it, so I give them away. But we don't see that anymore. We yeah. are all gone to the foreign um, tissue culture form. Yes, and, and we have at least three more minutes um, remaining in your segment for question and answers. I want to bring up the critical issue of coral bleaching that is um, linked to climate change and how it's going to affect our marine biodiversity. Any thoughts on those? Um, coral bleaching is, is more a matter of the coastal protection. When the, coral, when the coral bleaching dies, they break apart and the shoreline. So we have this, for example, in the north, we know the area. I mean, the coastline there has eroded tremendously over the last couple of years. I remember Dr. Julian Campbell from Puerto Rico and Andrew Simmons and us were measuring that and Port and those boys were measuring it. And they had some tremendous, I mean, it was amazing at how much of it has been lost. All of that has to do with coral bleaching. But while you go to the marine environment, I want to raise the issue of our, our queen conch and, and, and our lobsters. The fact that our lobsters, we are seeing our smaller and fewer, and I spoke to the guys and they said they have to go further and deeper to dive them now. What's the problem? What are we doing? Have we done anything that is it that the reefs are dying? Why we are not finding these guys? Why is the queen conch disappearing here? Is it that we over -hasting? I know up to until 2017, they had said that there was a fairly decent um, stock and that they, they were doing well. I don't know what has happened beyond that. But I was in Caraco a few months ago doing some work, and the fishermen said that the queen conch population is diminishing, and they're worried that it's going to be lost in a short space of time. I don't know if that's the case for St. Vincent, because the last stats I had from them said it was fairly balanced, so I don't know. But those are issues that need to be. The bleaching will really affect coast, the coastline, also the habitat for, um, for lobsters, etc. And then there's the problem of the queen conch. Those are issues we need to investigate. And probably, again, that's a nice paper for students to do the SBA on. Everybody wants to eat lamby. Uh, they don't have a concept of what it is and what's happening to it. One of the issues that I, I've seen over the years across the Caribbean is the lack of management plans for particular fishery species. But also, there is no 
um, real um, inventory of what we have. So we keep fishing, 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 and we're promoting this idea that we are exporting a particular um, species, but do we know exactly what is there? And do we look at the replenishment rate to ensure that it is sustained over a period of time? Okay, so I don't know that we do on the sea farm. People might be able to help us with that. The problem is fish, uh, fish stocks are not easy to monitor because they move and we are in this narrow economic zone where so many other people are catching and then we allow for people to come with their dragnets and go through the region and so we lost a lot. So we need to be a little bit more vigilant about how we, we, we protect these species, see what we have and see what we are losing. But that, that's a big topic and I don't know that I am qualified to speak yes, about Yes, 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 yes. All right, Dr. Murray, any closing um, remarks before we wrap things up with you? No, just my, my, my complaint, my call for the younger people to become involved in real conservation, not just talking about it, but getting them out in the field. Get, that, see if we could get the schools even to go in there. Now, see how many of them have parents who are connected with bush yams and and, 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 and and then see what they do and try to share the lessons so that people become really engaged, understanding how it has to do with their livelihood. Thank you very much, Dr. Murray, and I wish you all the very best. Peace to you, sir. Thank you, and good afternoon to all. Good afternoon. All right, that was Dr. Murray speaking on the biodiversity of St. Vincent and the Grenadines. And if you're just joining us, this is the online virtual talk featured a speaking or um, focused on the future of conservation engaging the next generation of environmental champions. So far, we have had some really good presentations and really good interactions from our audience. Please keep it coming, keep engaging, keep sending your comments and your questions. Great. Our next presenter is Ms. Tishana Magnicals. And Tishana represents the Sustainable Development Unit and um, she is the environmental analyst there, and she would be speaking on a topic, sustainable development, sorry, policies and plans promote environmental sustainability in St. Vincent and the Grenadine. Please make welcome Ms. Tishana thomas Mark. Thank you very much, Hayden, and good afternoon to everyone. First, I will give a general overview of the role of the Sustainable Development Unit, as well as some actions done on a continuous basis. And then I'd like to highlight a few projects we're currently implementing that aims to improve the management and preservation of our natural resources. So the Sustainable Development Unit within the Ministry of Tourism, Civil Aviation, Sustainable Development and Culture holds responsibility for the implementation of two of the three Rio Conventions, that's the United Nations Framework Convention on Climate Change and the Convention on Biological Diversity, as well as the Multilateral Environmental Agreements. The unit generally has a coordinating role in the management of our natural resources through the, natural, the National Ocean Coordination Committee and the recently approved and soon to be operationalized National Technical Advisory Committee on Climate Change. These committees comprise of representatives from all sectors to address issues related to ocean governance and climate change respectively. The unit mobilizes financial and technical support available from the United Nations conventions and through MEAs to enhance conservation efforts in SVG we continually collaborate with relevant line ministries and stakeholders to build awareness of key environmental issues through annually celebrated global environmental days, as well as through projects we implement. Now, in recent years, the unit has developed a strong, if I do say so myself, a strong national climate change framework and development agenda. And that includes a national climate change policy, national climate change strategy, and a national adaptation action plan. And has now received, re and has now received support through the Green Climate Fund to pursue climate resilience development by enhancing the national adaptation planning process in St. Vincent and the Grenadines. Under this project, the tourism sector adaptation plan 
and a coastal zone sector adaptation plan will be developed as these sectors were highlighted as high priority sectors due to their social, economic, and environmental significance to this country. Additionally, a private sector engagement strategy and action plan will be developed to stimulate increased private sector investment in climate change adaptation activities and to facilitate increased private sector investment in the adaptation planning process. I'm going to just briefly mention two projects that we are currently implementing. And the first one is the Jeff 7 SVG Coastal and Marine Equipment Strengthening Project. This project seeks to address the challenges for coastal and marine management at SVG, including anthropogenic pressures, institutional fragmentation, policy and regulatory inadequacies, and lack of adaptive capacity through data-driven solutions. I won't go into the activities due to time, but there are four pilot sites, which includes the Connery Beach, which is a turtle nesting beach, Brighton Beach, which is also a turtle nesting beach, the Richmond and Chateaubelle land and seascape, and lastly, the Grenadine namely the Tobago Keys, including Myra and Union Island. Each site will be heavily focused on biodiversity conservation, and we wish to engage in public-private community partnerships to sustainably improve the environmental issues in these pilot sites. And the last project I would mention is a regional project. It's the Crew Plus the title is Crew Plus, an integrated approach to water and wastewater management using innovating solutions and promoting financing mechanisms in the wider Caribbean region. And this project aims to implement innovative, technical, small scale solutions using an integrated wastewater and water and wastewater management approach. There are three pilot sites, the Correctional Facility at Belle Isle, three hotels on the South Coast, and the Kingston Fish Market. And we will be installing and commissioning wastewater treatment systems to improve wastewater management and to reduce its negative impacts on human health and the environment. So essentially in the future, uh, we would really like to see the replication of these pilots throughout the country where it needs to be and we wish to engage more in the public-private community partnerships. Um, we want all of intentions to take ownership and have a pride in the beauty of this country that we have and that we, we can all be environmental champions in our own right. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you very much, Tishana. That was very concise and to the point. And there are some nuggets of information that we can glean from your presentation. Thank you. And for all those who are online, you can send your questions or comments to Tishana at this moment. But Tishana, I have a few questions for you. You talked, you talked about the importance of having um, private community partnership in your projects. This obviously would include consultation with community for buy-in into your projects. How have, in your experience, how have those helped with um, garnering community support and what has been the efforts to include youths in these particular initiatives? Okay, so I would speak on the Jeff 7 project in particular here and um, before, well, during the conception phase, well, along the process of planning out all of the details that goes into the project, we did do some community consultations. And a lot of the, well, the response, they were very um, accepting and willing to um, participate in the project. I believe that persons do have interest in, consult well, I know Dr. Murray went down a hole, <laughs> but there are that that group out there that really um, 
have a passion for um, environmental conservation. And I, I believe when we, we call these things or we have community consultations, those are the people that really come out the most. So um, it went well, things went well, and yeah, it's, it's, it was a positive experience. Okay, so what can we do more to encourage persons more environmentally conscious and also to get on board in and getting involved in these projects? Because obviously we have done very poorly in communicating these, these, these ideals. What do you think is needed to improve our communication and to get these persons involved in environmental initiatives? Well, I think we should start from the little ones all the way up, you know, reaching out to schools in particular. And, I, and during consultations, you know, throughout with different projects, there seems to be a group that is that seems to always be missed. Um, the our faith-based organizations they generally have well-formed, um, structured groups that are more than willing to participate in any um, of these sorts of initiatives. So it's just a matter of us, you know, actually going out there and reaching all sector, all groups, all any, groups. anybody you can think of, just, yes. you know, go out and have that engagement. Absolutely. And I want to tease your brain a little bit. Have we looked at engaging the differently able, the blind, the deaf, in, in conservation? Well, in my um, short tenure here at the unit, I don't believe that we have, but that is something that we could definitely look into and see how best we can um, communicate to them these sorts of things. Awesome. Yeah. And before you go, I have another question for you. Um, you talked about a lot of plans, the climate change adaptation plan, the coastal zone plan, and lots of other plans. How what strategies do we have in place to ensure that these plans are translated into actions on the ground? And you could speak to one plan or just specifically strategies that you might have thought about to translate these plans into action on the ground. Okay, well, I guess the easiest one would be the National Adaptation Plan, which we actually just... I spoke about that project in trying to pursue, you know, um, so we're receiving funding from the GCF to undertake all the activities under, um, well, just a few activities under our national adapt overarching national adaptation plan. So funding plays a big role, uh, receiving um, technical um, capacity as well helps in that regard. Okay. Thank you very much. Uh, there are questions online for Tishana. So we'd like to thank you, Tishana, very much for your presentation and for taking part in the virtual talk. Thank you very much. Thank you. At this point, we're going to introduce our next speaker. And this is none other than Mr. Van Bon Harry. And Van Bon is the CEO. Oh, there's a question. Um, it's a little late, but Tishana is still there. There's a question from Alison Cookshank. Is there a timeline for starting the National Technical Group on Climate Change? Oh, good question. Um, anyone can answer the question at some point. Uh, we we'll come back to you, Alison. Let's um, shelve that for maybe the um, panel discussion, which would happen after these presentations. All right, so. Um, Van Bonhari is the CEO of the SVG Conservation Fund, and we invite him to make his presentation at this time. Thank you very much, Hayden, for that um, wonderful introduction. Always a pleasure, you know, being in the same space with you. Um, I want to thank National Park for inviting me to be a panelist um, for the Awareness Month and to speak on this topic, which is the future of conservation engaging the next generation of environmental champions. Uh, my presentation would focus a little bit on some key strategies um, that surrounds this topic and also the importance of why um, it, 
we need to involve the youth in our conservation efforts. But before I do that, I just want to um, speak a little about the, about the SVGCF. Uh, I think Radicha mentioned us very briefly in her presentation, but the St. Vincent Divinity's Conservation Fund is primarily a funding organization. We were set, we set up as that to provide funding for biodiversity in St. Vincent and the Grenadines. We were established in 2015. We became operational in 2018. And since then, we have disbursed um, about oh, just a little over $1.5 million towards conservation efforts in St. Vincent and the Grenadines. Um, we have a wide cross-section of, of, of projects that we've supported from marine conservation efforts to, to um, pollution, um, farming, sustainable farming, um, you name it. We, we've, we've funded it, we've supported it. But all that being said, we also um, recognize the need for engaging with the youth in our efforts. So we do have a very vibrant volunteer program that's ongoing. Anyone can become a part of that. We also um, try to, well, not try to, we also do school visits and have uh, workshops with, with schools as well. So we, we recognize, but we can only do so much or any organization can do so, so much. But the point is that it is a holistic approach that requires education, it requires empowerment, and it requires community engagement in order for us to secure a sustainable future for conservation in St. Vincent and the Grenadines, and by extension, the region, because we know by no stretch of the imagination uh, should we think that St. Vincent is in a bubble by itself. We are part of the OECS, we're part of the CARICOM, we're part of the entire region. So that is how we have to think going forward, a regional approach to everything that we do. Um, but very quickly, I'll run through it. I have a, a, a small um, WhatsApp, no, sorry, PowerPoint presentation. Uh, which I want to share. So I just press present, Hayden, to share that. Hayden, are you there? Can anybody, can everybody see my screen? Not sure. Oh. All right, I, I, I think so. All right, so. Good. All right, so my, my presentation will focus, as I said, on some key strategies and the importance of engaging the youth. But as we know, um, this is a very timely topic for discussion and a very forward looking one. Um, and we recognize that involving the youth in our conservation efforts is crucial. The younger generation, they are the future. We are not the future. We are here to, to guide and, and, and preserve what they can enjoy in the future. So we have to engage a younger generation. And we have to do that by empowering them and involving them in all of the conservation activities that we perform. So I just want to touch on a key, on a few key points and strategies uh, for the future of conservation in St. Vincent and the Grenadines. First one, of course, and I think everybody would relate to that, is environmental education. Um, there is a need to incorporate a comprehensive environmental education into the curriculum of schools and educational institution. Second, 
youth empowerment. And as I said before, we must empower the young people to take an active role in our conservation efforts and activities. We need to be able to help create youth-led organizations that would empower them and, and help them to contribute and share their ideas in all of the efforts that we do. Community involvement, we must engage our communities. And I know that through the different organizations that are involved in conservation, community gain involvement is, is paramount and is key in terms of getting the work done and getting that buy-in in, in the communities. So that is a must. Technology and innovation. We, we, we understand and recognize that the world is a technologically um, advanced more than it was 10, 5, 20 years ago. And we need to leverage that technology with the kind of work that we are doing by using social media and, and virtual reality um, to help with the efforts of conservation and even with awareness and education as well, these technologies can help. Biodiversity protection. This should be something that is prioritized because without our e environment, the, well, we have no country, we have no life. It, it, the economy stops everything, you know? Um, so biodiversity protection should be at the forefront of every government throughout the, the, the region to ensure that their, our natural resources are, uh, are preserved and protected and that we can enjoy it um, and our, our future generations can enjoy it. Sustainable practices. We need to promote sustainable practices in agriculture, fishing, and tourism. And this goes a very long way. Sanya, the first presenter, would have spoken about um, the fishery sector. Dr. Murray would have spoken a little about um, agriculture and replanting the food and seed banks and so forth. So we need to be very mindful of that. Youth programs. We need to develop programs and mentorship and internship opportunities for our youth. Uh, this can help to inspire them to pursue environmental careers for, in conservation, which later on in the future, of course, um, will, will help with all of the efforts that we are doing now. They can then take up the mantle and, and carry on. Awareness campaigns. I think this speaks for itself that we need to run public awareness campaigns, projects that we include a line item for awareness or, or uh, an education, but this has to be an ongoing, an ongoing process because all of the, the attitudes and activities that people do uh, that is surrounded ar around the environment and conservation are learned behaviors in everything that we do. It, it's learned behavior. So it has to be an ongoing process where we start with the young generation as, as early as kindergarten, all the way up to tertiary education so that it becomes a part of them. Policy and advocacy, and we can't get anything done without this, of course. So we need to encourage young advocates to participate in policy decisions and decide decisions regarding environmental regulations and protection. Ecotourism. We must promote ecotourism, not just in St. Vincent, but throughout the region, emphasizing um, re responsible and sustainable tourism practices. And this can help generate both revenue and awareness for conservation efforts. International collaboration. We are a small island developing state, and sometimes we, we lack the expertise, we lack the funding. So we must foster good relationship with international conservation organizations that can assist in this regard. Monitoring and, monitoring and research. We must invest in research and monitoring programs to better understand local ecosystems and track and the impact of conservation. Hayden um, posed a question to Dr. Murray regarding the coral bleaching. And I think this touches um, on that aspect of monitoring, monitoring and research because there is nothing you can, we can do about coral bleaching in, in essence. Yeah, I mean, the water temperature 
rises, it affects the corals, um, they bleach, they die. Uh, some of them, the, the temperature changes back and some of them catch back themselves and, and rejuvenate, but it requires monitoring and research um, that would enable us or, or guide us as to which, which corals, which genomes are more resilient to these effects, to the rising temperatures. And, you know, um, which corals do we need to start paying more attention to and, and, and protecting more and, 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 and so forth. Resilience planning. We need to consider the impacts of climate change and develop strategies for climate resilience. And of course, we need to engage the youth in climate adaptation and mitigation measures. Now, why is it important to involve the youth in environmental conservation? Um, for one, long-term stewardship. The younger generation will be the stewards of the environment in the future, so it's important to, to involve them. Two, fresh perspectives. Young people often bring fresh perspectives and innovative ideas to environmental challenges. Their creativity and openness to new technologies can lead to more effective and sustainable solutions. Three, educational impact. Environmental education at a young age is more likely to influence lifelong values and behaviors and foster a culture of environmental responsibility. Four, local knowledge. Young people often have an intimate understanding of their local environment because they as Dr. Murray was saying, a lot of them go out in the bush, they hunt with the older folks and all that too. Um, so they might have the insights into the unique challenges and opportunities for conservation in St. Vincent and the Grenadines. Advocacy and activism. Young people can be powerful advocates for change. Their voices and passion can drive public awareness and policy change. Technology proficiency, we know that the younger generation as 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 early as possible, they they are into technology, but we need to we need to encourage them and help them to use this kind of technology, and in and involve them in in the conservation efforts that we're doing. So, just very just very quickly, I know that my time is coming close to an end, or probably has ended already. But um, as I said, it requires a, a holistic approach um, in terms of trying to preserve the natural beauty and biodiversity for future generations in St. Vincent and and in the region. And this would involve education, empowerment, community involvement uh, to ensure that sustainable and environmental conscious future for the region. But I want us to remember that engagement of the younger generation is crucial and that active engagement of the younger generation is also a wise investment for the future because when we are gone, they will carry on and we need to empower them. So that's my presentation and I hope that it um, has shed some light on the topic um, just a bit more. So I would stop there and pass it over to Hayden. Thank you, my colleague, Van Born Harry. <laughs> Sorry to go over your time here, Nami, you know? <laughs> okay. All right, so I have a yeah. question for you. Um, when Rudika was presenting and then you came and hit um, the proverbial hammer on the nail head, um, you talked about conservation and the financing that are available for the work of environmental conservation and so on and so forth. Um, yeah. I'm wondering whether there's a strategy that you have in place to target youth, youth groups, first of all, and what has been the uptake of these grants by youth organizations? Well, to be honest, um, most of the organizations that we have had any sort of relationship with in terms of providing um, financial support for projects on the ground, 
have not been youth led. Um, most of them have been established for a while and they have a lot of experienced players involved in those organizations. We recently got a grant from the IAF where we would have done some training for, uh, for I can't even remember how much now, but um, maybe about 40 something CSOs across in Minson and the Grandines. Um, so in that regard, yeah, there were some that were youth led, but very incipient, they didn't have the structure that was needed, so they need guidance. As I said, one of the important things that we need to pay attention to, we need to have, um, while we do need to have youth led organization, they need mentorship, they need guidance in order for them to have that experience and know um, what is involved in what they're getting into. Okay, so great. So are we yeah. seeing any capacity building grants that could potentially bring these youth organizations up to par where they can apply for the grant funding through your organization? Yeah, of course. Um, one of the activities that we do fund um, actually involves capacity building. Uh, so, and we do have an annual call. Um, every year there's a call out and that is one of the the activities that we would fund. Um, groups that need their capacity built in terms of um, whether it's to manage their finances, um, they could write a project, a uh, proposal, sorry, submit it to us. And once our technical advisory committee is, is pleased, they, they will recommend that to the board. And of course, the board will approve it and they'll get funded. Great, thank you. I have, based on my experience, Van Bon, I, I, I've seen the, um, the youth organizations not feeling confident enough to write a proposal. Proposal mm -hmm. writing is a science by itself, and persons may feel intimidated that the proposal format might be above their heads. How can the SPG CF facilitate the proposal writing process for these young, emergent, and youth organizations? Well, um, as, I, as I briefly mentioned there, under the IAF grant that we currently have and we're ma managing now, we did have um, an activity, a component in, the, in this grant where we would train these um, civil society organizations, community-based organizations, NGOs, and there is an aspect of project writing as well. So they would have benefited tremendously from all, all of that. Um, apart from that, aside from that, we do have, we've not done it yet, we've, we've um, assisted some of our grantees who have been funded already in terms of um, guidance when they submitted their project, um, we would respond and we make comments to let them know, well, hey, you need to do this, you need to do that, you need to tighten up in these areas. So we, pro we do provide that kind of support to persons who submit proposals. But apart from that, we we do have um, on our agenda as well to to host workshops and seminars for pro, for proposal writing, and I think some other organizations have done that in the past. And um, I just want to say that these groups need to be on the lookout for when these opportunities come come up, so that they could really make take advantage of it. Okay, great. Thank you so much, uh, Mr. Bonborn Harry. And of course, we're looking forward to have young and youthful organizations applying for these grants. Alison Cookshan said maybe there's an opportunity for some young environmental professionals to become project writers for hire. What are Sorry. your thoughts? Yeah, of course, of course. I mean, from time to time, there are grants that are out there, but I mean, even us, we have capacity issues as well. You know, as an organization, you might not have the time. Um, your personnel is, is focused on something else. You need somebody who can write a grant. Of course, there, there's, there's opportunities for that. Great. Yeah. Well, thank you very much, Mr. Harry, for your time and for your insight. And we wish you all the very best with your Thank you. You're welcome. Right. Goodbye. All right, thank you very much. Um, we are coming close to the end of the presentations and we are thanking you for sticking around this long.
Um, at this point, we'll invite Mr. Odwin Andrews. He is the technical officer for the Sustainable Grenadines, Inc. And he'll be speaking about the work that they're doing there in the Sunny Grenadines and in St. Vincent and Grenada, hopefully. Welcome, Mr. Odwin Andrews. Thank you very much, Hayden. And uh, thank you, National Parks, for having us um, a part of this roundtable discussion, which is very timely. Um, it's pleasant good afternoon to the listening audience and my fellow panelists. Before I move forward, I just want to give a virtual big up to Mr. Murray, Dr. Murray, for your presentation. I wanted to join in and have that dialogue with you because these are things that among ourselves within Sussgren is an everyday conversation. And definitely this conversation needs to continue more, um, if not now, but at a further date. However, um, my mission here today is to speak about sustainable grenadines and the work that we do. Um, first off, Sustainable Grenadines is a transboundary non-governmental organization. We are committed to the conservation of coastal and environmental and sustainable livelihoods for the people of the Grenadine Islands between St. Vincent and Grenada. Um, our core activities um, include the trainings, um, small project supports, um, exchange, networking, awareness, linkage activities between the governments, as well as external, external donors. Um, Sustainable Grenadines, we were officially established in 2010. Um, just to give you a brief history, um, as I say, we were um, conceptualized through CERMES and we had this development over a period of years before we were officially registered in 2010. Um, as I said, the areas that we cover, we work within um, conservation and environmental development. Um, we support civil organizations as well. Um, the history has proven we've supported more than 13 civil organizations and government agencies to complete many projects and so forth. Capacity, capacity building as well, um, we've done that throughout the years. Some of our recent works um, include working with school children from the Grenadine Island of Beckway all the way to Karyaku, where um, we would engage them in activities. Now, all of our projects are funded, I must state that. And these funded projects, we sit within the organization, we look at areas that needs help and development. And of course, all that would have been mentioned by my fellow panelists, especially food security, we've tried to focus on these areas. Um, of course, <clears throat> sorry, of course, as it relates to food security, agriculture, we've worked with the Union Island Secondary School through funding from the French um, embassy, where we establish a ecological farm. And these kids were engaged hands-on, not only practical, but the theory part of it. So what we tend to do in order for us to achieve, as the topic states, the future of conservation engaging the next generation of environmental champions, what we do is that we don't just go out and speak about the importance of the environment. How do we get this um, future generation? By engaging the younger ones, um, helping them to have that experience hands-on. And that um, project, ecological project, I must say, was one of the most successful projects um, as it relates to the engagement of youth. Now, Sustainable Grandings, we are based in Ashton Lagoon, which is the largest mangrove um, swamp in St. Vincent and the Grenadines. And within this area as well, we've done a lot of work with the community. To everything that we've done, we always engage the community. Now, very important to speak about the Ashton Lagoon. This project, of course, um, was to restore the damage done to the ecosystem from a failed marina project in the early 90s. Um, this, of course, is our largest project. Um, fortunately for us, our base, our office is located within our workspace, which is the Ashton Lagoon. And uh, the pilot project for building resilience using eco-base adaptation to provide benefits for human and nature. So this eco trail was developed with the involvement of the community and the youth, especially um, our mangrove replantation that this was done, uh, led, of course, um, by Mr. Um, Matthew, 
Matthew Harvey. Um, that was on the CMBP where we replanted 3,000 red mangroves. And of course, through that, youth from the schools, the various schools, primary and secondary, were engaged in that. So um, we are committed towards the engagement of youth. Um, part of our mandate um, is the engagement, as I said, for youth and throughout everything we have been doing that. As it relates to um, the environment and the funds that we've received, um, as I mentioned before, walking from Beckwith to Karaku, one of our um, projects is the Philip Stevenson Foundation, which I must mention, engaging, connecting kids with nature. Um, this is a project that we take um, throughout the islands. We engage these youth in different activities. Um, in Beckway, we did sea moss. So they learned about the different types of sea moss, the technique of planting and so forth. And of course, we engage all stakeholders, government, private sectors, and so forth. And these kids, at the end of each session, they're not only able to walk away with just the information, but they also walk away with the, um, the experience, which I think is very important if we are to get these youths engaged. Because myself, I'm not that old, but I'm not that young. But honestly, sometimes even reading information, you have all this compact information and we know kids don't take the time to read. So we have to be more creative um, by getting them involved. Our social media platforms, we try to create as much content that are simplified um, easy for them to understand. And of course, now that we've done that, we've realized that even the schools on Union Island, Beckway, Karaku, they reach out to us, hey, well, how can we guys, how can you guys um, help us out? How can we be engaged? Um, we see you doing this. These are things that we would like to. And of course, to say through funding, we depend heavily on funding. So we have to sometimes sit, brainstorm, how do we come up with this fund? So we have a lot of um, proposal writing and it was a staff of four people. And as Van Bon would have said earlier on, um, sometimes, you know, you're focused on trying to do one thing, but at the same time, you know, the important things that needs to be done. So you know, it's very important for us to try and simplify things as much as possible where the youths are concerned. Um, so that's basically my contribution um, as it relates to sustainable grenadines, if there are any comments or questions. All right, thank you, Mr. Andrews. Um, I'm looking at the, um, where did you go? I'm looking at the chat to see if there are any questions. Uh, I'm not seeing anything online so far, but uh, it's particularly interesting to see how you can come up with practical ways of involving kids. Uh, you talked about the community kids with Natia. Um, what has been some of the highlights that came out of that project and how did you what strategy did you use to engage youths because i know youths they do not understand the technical terminologies and the jargons so what strategy did you employ in that particular uh, project right of course as i mentioned before it's all a matter of simplifying um what you're doing when you're dealing with kids um, you cannot go to these children with these large scientific terms. Of course, when they get at a, a later stage in secondary college, then they would adapt to and understand that. So the approach that we took is that we try to simplify our message as much as possible and give tangible benefits to these kids. So that, for instance, the connecting kids with nature, um, they are engaged in snorkeling. So we don't just teach them how to snorkel. They receive their snorkeling gears. Right. Also very important, which I did not get to mention because of time, um, is our coral gardeners. We also have community researchers. Um, these community researchers are locally trained young individuals. And um, the coral gardeners especially very important to mention. Um, these young people, they are now engaged after they were trained and as a form of employment, because now that the project is completed, you need the maintenance of the coral sites and so forth. These are the same young individuals who are now engaged, employed, and then, of course, walking around the community. Sometimes I hear little snippets of people, of these young people talking among themselves. And once one is interested and it's something that they find fun, they will then pass the, the, the message on and others will become interested. 
So those are some of the strategies that we tend to use when we are trying to get youth involved with regards to this. Thank you, Adwin. Uh, there's a comment from Holly Bino. Congratulations on the amazing work you are doing with Suscreen. I'm always so intrigued when I see your updates. So your social media campaigns are reaching very far. And there's another comment from another individual, which I'm not seeing now. Could you project that for me, please, um, 20? Um, that one I've seen before. Could you project the other one? Uh, Mark John said, keep connecting the kids with Natia and the environment because they are the future. Thank you so very much, Odwin. Thanks, Mark and Holly. And Augustine Ambrose said, very informative and engaging presentations. Thank you very much, Odwin. You're welcome. All right. All right. So I am very happy that you are engaged. Um, Mr. Uh, sorry, Eddie James Adams said, very important and commendable practices, Mr. Andrews. I think the same could be done on the mainland if you retain the interest of at least 25% of these young people, we will be off to a good start. Congrats on the work in the Grenadines. Absolutely. So at this point, we're going to invite um, our last presenter for it, our first segment. And stick around because we have the panel discussion coming up. It's going to be insightful. It's going to be exciting. It's going to be so informative. So please stick around. At this moment, we would like to introduce Mr. Fitzgerald Providence. Um, Mr. Providence is the director of the forestry um, department, and he'll be presenting um, on the theme. Okay, there he is. He can tell you what, you, what he's presenting on. Welcome, Mr. Fitzgerald Providence. <laughs> Mr. Providence, we can't hear you. Can you go ahead and unmute your mic, please? Oh, sorry. <laughs> Thank you. Um, I, I, um, I will say um, good afternoon to all, Hayden, and the rest of the panel. Um, thank you for having me to discuss this important topic of the future of conservation, engaging the next generation of environmental champions. Um, it's a very timely topic as we look at sustainable development and, and we must link the importance of the environment to sustainable development in St. Vincent and the Grenadines. As I would um, always tell persons, um, you have to know, know what we have, where it is and value it in order to protect it better. And we are stewards of the earth in that um, I'm not here forever. And we actually tend to borrow the environment from the future. So we have to take care of what we have for the future generations. And as a forester, the director of forestry, it's important that we look at the terrestrial environment in terms of the forests of St. Vincent and the Grenadines. We in the forestry department, we look at the global, the global target of at least 30% of your land area should be protected protected forest area. We tend to want to look at more than that in terms of we have forests of more than 30% cover of St. Vincent in the Grenadines because it's dry forest, it may be less, but here, particularly where I am presently in Union Island, we look at protecting critical forest areas for the biodiversity they contain. But not only biodiversity or forest contains, it contains um, it has what you call the ecosystem services. The ecosystem services of providing water, the water which we drink so much, in terms of not only the groundwater that it helps to store, but also the process of um, the water cycle that the forests play a very important role in. And one of our forests 
reserves in St. Vincent and the Grenadines, the Kingsill Forest in the southeast corner of the island of St. Vincent was protected as a forest reserve since 1791. It is a part of one of global, the first global recognized environmental um, conservation legislation and, a, and an environment legislation that links to climate and climate change in that when it was made a reserve, it was made a reserve to protect the water in that area, actually to bring rain to the areas of, of um, Enums and those areas that surround Kings Hill. It functioned in terms of the what we call the orographic rainfall in that it, it caused the moist, warm air from off the um, Atlantic Ocean to rise and then condense and you have the rainfall that would help to water the farmlands that are around. We have changed the land use in that area to mainly um, housing, there's a lot of housing, but it's important that we protect reserves like this because they help to sustain the water. We've seen in these past months we've had extreme climate, extreme temperatures and little rainfall. What is the role of forests in sustaining these? We're able to still drink um, potable water on mainland um, because the water catchment areas still seem to provide water. We do feel the dew in the morning and the forest plays a very important role in trapping that dew, helping it to infiltrate and percolate into the water watershed areas so that we can still maintain a good flow of water um, during what is an extreme dry September, October. So we have that, that resource of, of the ecosystem service of protecting or uh, providing water. The forest also protects um, our soil in terms of we in the islands, all of the islands, both on St. Vincent and the Grenadines are volcanic islands. The Grenadines are older, um, but the St. Vincent is the youngest in the group of Grenadines, St. Vincent and the Grenadines. And we see the importance of the forests and vegetation protecting the steep slopes um, from erosion. And when that erosion comes down, it goes into the surrounding sea and ocean and, and um, there's pollution. You stifle the coral, then you have coral de dead back. And if there's no coral, which is the pasture, the, the, the green area of the, of the sea, where you have a lot of algae and, and the presence of coral and life of, of the plants, of sorry, of the fish. If the coral is dead, you don't have any fish. So it's important to see now where these things are linked to livelihoods in terms of we have the forest right now, we have the, the open season for hunting. We encourage conservation and wise use of the time in your hunting. But we see that the, the animals in the forest, the partially protected species such as the iguana and the, the manicua or possum and the aguti become available for hunters to catch for recreation, get some recreation also to provide some form of livelihood and some form of um, food, food, food supplement. And um, also in terms of the, the aspect of the livelihood goes down to the fishing sea where fishermen depend on healthy water, oxygenated water coming from the rivers, going into the sea um, and sustaining the coral reefs around that provide food for us in terms of fish and lobsters and things like that. Also um, agriculture, which is usually in the middle areas that we call the middle basin of the watershed. They are, the water supply is very important for these areas in that it um, gives um, ir ability for irrigation of our water, of our, of our agricultural land, so that persons who depend on agriculture can have irrigated um, irrigation and also the dependence on, the rain, on a good rainfall. So it's important to protect our forests and for the next generation to know the role of forests, the trees, vegetation in the sustainable development or our sustainable existence, existence on St. Vincent and the Grenadines. So we must learn the next generation um, to protect and better conserve the environment. We in forestry, we have our mission, which is to protect, develop, protect, conserve, and develop the forest resources of St. Vincent and the Grenadines 
with and for the people of St. Vincent and the Grenadines because we see that, that important connection of forests and biodiversity conservation in the role of maintaining life and livelihoods on, on, on St. Vincent and the Grenadines. Um, as we celebrate our independence and national recognition of our country, and um, being an independent country, we must also celebrate the uniqueness of our island in terms of the endem endemism of our terrestrial biodiversity, including the the, um, the St. Vincent parrot, the whistling warbler. In the Grenadines, we have particularly in Union Island, we have the um, Union Island gecko, gonotoad, one of the species, one of two species that we are able to identify in the 21st century, um, which is the Union Island gonotoad and the pink rhino iguana. And we see the importance of protecting our forest areas, or uh, particularly the Chatham Bay area and Union for that, for that um, protecting of that species. And I, was, I would say when I learned a lot about the, the, the environment of St. Vincent, the natural forest resources of St. Vincent, it was not in a school textbook or while going to school. It was at sitting at the feet of older persons. Um, most of them has passed, like Dr. Earl Kirby, a person, a vet by training, but an archeologist and a, and a nature lover by just being. And he taught me a lot in terms of the, the environment. So I think um, one of the previous panelists mentioned the importance of education but not only education from the textbook, but education from the experience in terms of going out there and learning about the environment, learning about the, the, the role of the environment, learning about our flora and fauna in our sustaining our livelihoods in St. Vincent and the Grenadines. And um, I'd also like to commend the, that we must work through community groups where we are losing um, community groups in St. Vincent and the Grenadines, but we do still have some around. In Union Island, I'm working with the Union Island Environmental Alliance. They work well with us in terms of protection and conservation of the, the Chatham Bay area and the, the Gonotoad along with the, the Union Island, um, along with the Pink Rhine Iguana. Also, we have community groups such as GEMS who were instrumental over the years in, in in the conservation efforts around the Kingsville Forest Reserve. We have the, the Rose Hall Drummers groups and we have other community groups and we want to encourage other community groups to, to build and, and see their role in protection of the environment and also the youth. The youth, maybe we spend too much time on the social media and, 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 and with our heads in a, in a phone or something like that. We need to get out there and, and, and get into the environment. The, the, the resilience, the recreation, the, the, the vital um, process, revitalization process of working in the environment is important in our general health. And we need to get out there and protect our forests, our trees for our, our sustained livelihood here in St. Vincent and the Grenadines. And finally, I'd like to talk about trees and, and the, the ecosystem in our urban environment. As um, I was saying, with this past, well, globally, they have been recording um, extreme temperatures. But how many persons recognize the importance of trees, particularly in the urban, urban environment, which some people call the concrete jungle, um, where you have a lot of infrastructure, concrete, that just absorb the heat. And then when it's even in the evening, late evening, you feel in that heat radiating off the buildings. What is the role of the environment? More trees, properly planted trees, to not only beautify the, our towns and villages, but to help to calm that heat from the from the extreme temperatures we've been having these days. So it's important for us to know what we have in terms of our biodiversity, our terrestrial and marine biodiversity, and also to recognize the role that they play in sustaining life and livelihood, and also the role they play in ensuring that we have future generations to enjoy these resources. So I want to ask that the, the next generation empower themselves through knowledge, through learning, through experience, 
in terms of looking at our environment and protection for future generations. So thank you very much. Thank you very much, Mr. Providence. Um, that was very comprehensive. And I, I, I must say that I'm a forest engineer um, because one of your environmental campaigns that you've had when I was a kid, um, there was this campaign about protecting the Amazona Gildingi, and you, you guys came to our school, and I was so intrigued by the story, by nature, by what you were offering, what you were selling to me, that I bought it, and I uh, pursued a career in forest engineering and environmental management. So it speaks to the importance of awareness and uh, basically engaging the youth at a very young age. But you talked about um, the importance of not only traditional um, knowledge, but using the people who you consider their feet and learn. How important is storytelling in that regard? Storytelling is very important because I've learned a lot about the natural history of St. Vincent and the Grenadines by just listening to people. Um, they may not tell the story like uh, Bear Nancy's story, but they just tell the history, a history that cannot be written in books, but a history that passes through their experience. So we sit and, and we listen to them. Um, sometimes we like to go to Google for everything, but Google doesn't have everything. It doesn't have the real story, the real being there and learning and, and um, sitting at someone's feet, listening, taking time off to listen. We tend to rush through everything. Everything is like instant coffee these days. It's time we take time to to relax and listen. And and, and as the, the the sheep, the ruminants taking the, the grass and the ruminating it, we need to sit, ruminate and build. And as I say, knowledge is the power to protect our environment. But greater than that is a love for the environment. Um, you can have all the knowledge in the world, but if you don't love what you're doing or love the environment you're on, it doesn't make any sense knowing because um, then you can't do what you want to do to protect it for future generations. Thank so you. storytelling is very important. Absolutely. Thank you so much, Providence. Any questions from the... Um, any questions from the live audience? I'm not seeing any right now, but thank you very much for Gerald. And I hope you stick around to lend your voice to um, the noises as we create a shocking earthquake on environmental awareness today and in the future. Thank you so much. You're welcome. Thank you. All right, great. Thank you so very much for all of you who are still on the live. And Tonique is asking me whether we should have everybody from the panel on, on camera. Yes, I'd like everybody on the panel to be on camera. And I thank everybody who's watching so far. Please share the live and please leave your comments and your questions so we can have an engaging evening. Um, so at this point, I'd like to invite all of the panelists to come on. I'm going to call the names. Feel free to join um, the video platform. All right, so we have, first of all, Mr. Alan Soon Cookshank. He is an environmental consultant. Uh, we also have Mr. Adwin Andrews, who is representing Sustainable Communities Incorporated. Ms. Delight Oliver from the Fisheries Division. Ms. Diana Nero from the Caribbean Youth Environmental Network, SBG Chapter. And Mrs. Well, Mrs. Aria Ladle Ferdinand, who's a consultant and lecturer at the SBGCC, and she has brought with her some students. Welcome. And finally, but by no means least, Mr. Jeremy Searles from the Fisheries Division. Welcome to the panel discussion. Oh, there you are, all of you. <laughs> Okay, very well. So we have had quite a bit of discussion this morning, presentation this morning, on a wide array of topics. First of all, one of the things that jumped out at me was the importance of youth empowerment, mentorship, and internship. How do we incite and excite young people to be part of the environmental movement? 
also how do you incorporate technology and innovation ai chat gbt gpt and all these applications to environmental conservation and communication also how do we include environmental matters in our school's curriculum and also we are good at writing beautiful technical papers and we are bad at communicating them to the relevant audience how important it, it is to make sure that there's enough budget in your projects to focus on environmental education awareness and i have had the experience where projects would just tag on at 20 percent for communication and awareness and 80 percent for practical which might make sense application in the field but we have seen too many technical reports i am tired of reviewing them i'm tired of writing them and then they end up on a shelf nicely adorned with dust how can we change that narrative Let's talk about the future of conservation, engaging the next generation of environmental champions. How do we propose to do that? If you're not going to start, I want to call names, okay? And I'm well, happy to have students, so I'll have to yeah. um, I'll, I'll, I'll go for a student. Okay. All right. So what you mentioned there, um, very importantly, finance, um, of course, resources in general. Finance and human resources are very important as it relates to um, achieving this goal. And uh, however, we know, and you know also as well, when you're implementing projects, as you clearly stated, it's a small percentage that's allocated towards the um, education and social media part of things. So... We mentioned social media. Social media is basically free. This is where our creativity needs to come in. You understand? So I think that by being creative, creating simple contents for these youth, then you can, of course, because everyone, every youth these days, as we see, they're on their phones. So those are the areas we need to tap into, right? As it relates to the school curriculum, not everything, um, will be added as we are hoping towards the, cur the curriculum. So what we need to do as organizations and what we are doing as an organization is that we are reaching out to the schools and engaging them in these activities. So those are some of the approaches, I think, and as it relates to resources, it's just about being creative among ourselves and our organizations in order for us to achieve such. Odwin, I'm happy mm -hmm. you mentioned being creative. Um, you could have 20% of communication on your budget um but it is a wise wise use of these resources one but i also want to challenge you that sometimes our resources allocation is based on our prioritization how we view environment how we view the importance of communicating it to our audience can somebody agree with me that we have not put enough emphasis on prioritizing communicating environmental matters to the relevant the relevant um audience but also that it is packaged in an exciting way in a salacious sexy way that it pulls young people in let's have that conversation Is that really all right so who should go now i <laughs> sorry i'm i'm jumping in uh thank you hayden for saying that and that is a brilliant point i literally was just writing something something similar how how exactly do we package this i think sometimes we have the issue of we just taking everything as a one size fits all and we don't necessarily take the time to you know tailor our message to our audiences so then sometimes you might end up with something really complex and then you're just throwing that at young persons and it's like they don't know what to do with the information uh so i'm glad that you said that but also uh something that i was thinking that we need to be mindful of is the let me just say reporting back a lot of times we we do work things are done we engage persons we get them involved and then at the end of it we don't necessarily go back and say hey this, this is what we did this is what your input 
would have factored into you know that sort of participatory approach uh, it's just like just sometimes what happens is that the persons feel kind of used it's like so you they only see us when we they want we, we want something but then the final product they're not usually um privy or uh, it's not necessarily made that accessible to the same persons who we would have you know bent over backwards to trying to get into consultations and workshops very salient point and how well do we do once communicating how do we gather the level of impact how do we gather how do we measure impact is also an important point uh, i know alanson and aria had their mic open for a while who wants to go first ladies first or <laughs> yeah. yes my students were here waiting for a while ladies first, ladies first. <laughs> um okay. can everyone hear me yes very loud and clear yes. um thank you um national parks for having us today i just want to before i start introduce four of my green engineering year two students we have janessa dorham <laughs> zinis primus tristan simmons and gabriel levine um Welcome. really timely and important topic as it pertains to communicating to young people especially to get them engaged i think one of the problems when we're developing our communication strategies is that it is often not tailored to our target audiences and the messages are not crafted you know sometimes we create a one size fit all sort of event. um in addition to that uh, we spoke about being creative in delivering our messages um, one of the presenters mentioned the fact that we have great social media presence, but my students here, they were saying maybe on Facebook, but Facebook is for old people. <laughs> um, last year, I gave them one of their assignments was to do a TikTok um, video on renewable energy in St. Vincent and Grandines, and the winning team got a prize. And I think the winning Tristan was on the winning group and they got over 700 likes for their reel and i asked them what are some of the strategies that they use and they mentioned um you mentioned using hashtags like hashtag green hashtag go green hashtag for your page that would get it on other people's for your page so they would get a spike spike an interest in watching the video and we use all sorts of um we use songs that are trending as well so that it would capture young people's attention also. Right, right. So I think it's important that we consider platforms as well. So we like the jingles on the radio and, and we like our posts on Facebook and they have their place. But if we're truly talking about targeting Gen Z and the younger generations, we have to think about the other platforms out, like, out there that they are more frequent on. Absolutely critical. And um the only, the, only, the only topic of young people and how they receive and, and, and consume information. Could you talk to us about how you like to see your information packaged? Apart from how it's shared and promoted, what is your preference for packaging? Question to the students? Yes, yeah, to the students. Yeah, to the students. How would you like to see your information packaged? Um... Well, for me, I'm a visual learner, kind of. So all sorts of like graphic um, representation would catch my attention and that would help me learn more and better. Yeah, I feel like that would be good. Yeah, especially like I feel animated videos could yes. help a lot. So you could make, they don't have to be long. They could be like short, simple animated videos that like bring awareness to some of the situations or more events that are happening. Absolutely. And, and if I may just chime in here, I, okay. I do agree with these students because what we have witnessed from Suspense standpoint, with a plug with our social media, we are on Instagram, we are on Twitter, Instagram, mm -hmm. Suspense Inc., Twitter the same, Suspense Inc., our website, www.suspense.org, and our Facebook page, um, Suspense. However, um, to get back to what uh, the students were saying, the package, what we've realized when our when we change our methodology of presenting is that we have more audience watching videos and photos. Mm -hmm. Of course, we would have written content, but what we realize is that people don't take time to read a 
uh, seven, eight paragraph um, message online. You quicker, you know, gravitate to a video as 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 the students would have mentioned, you know, um, music that are hype and you know something that is present to them and more attracting. So point taken, I must agree with them because we've seen that change and improvement in our social media as it relates to the target audience of the youth. Thank you, Alvin. Um, Alison, you had an interjection. Yeah, um, I was going back to, and good afternoon, everybody. I'm glad to see so many familiar faces, Aria, and I'm glad to see the students of Green Engineering, a program that I actually started at the college, and oh, the, owner, <laughs> the owner, one of my former environmental club members is now in charge at CYE and SVG. So there's a progression that you will see over time, and I'm, I'm, I'm pleased to be in a position to see it now. And of course, Jeremy and um, Delight, good evening, and Hardwin as well. Um, what I was just thinking back um, about is in terms of impact. Um, national parks who are who, um, who are responsible for this program this afternoon, they did the Reef Guardian program a few years ago, which I was involved in at two primary schools, uh, Calico, Anglican, and uh, at the Sugar Mill um, Academy. They wanted schools within the South Coast area. And one of the things that stood out to me was that we had so many projects within that project in which project in which the students were intimately involved. One was on the lionfish, and the one was um, focused on cleaning up the area around the primary school at Calico, including that little ravine that runs down um, past the, the, the fisheries area um, in that location. And uh, even till now, some of the students, they are big now in secondary school, but they will still meet me up. And they would they would talk about eat it to beat it for the lionfish and so on. So these are things that stood out to them. I mean, they don't remember the rest of the project, yeah. but they remember coming in talk with the lionfish and people coming and asking them questions. And they were the ones at the forefront. And I think that that really left an indelible mark on them. And I think that is very important that we recognize that whatever um, touches a chord or strikes a chord in the emotions will tend to last longer. Um, because when people get emotionally involved in, 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 in these issues, then they, they, they tend to look at it more from a philosophical standpoint as well, as just um, as opposed to just looking at it as information that comes to me. Then there is a, a case of how can I make a difference? How can I do something about it? Which is that, um, that type of behavioral mindset that you really want to encourage. Absolutely. Thanks, Alanson. Diana, you represent a very critical youth environmental network. How has been your experience engaging youths and communicating environmental matters to youths? Uh, so one thing I like to mention, this by no one has actually mentioned it before, is the approach of the data an analytics. When we have the different social media platforms, we actually have to do a deep dive into the background as it pertains to what are our reach in terms of our posts, who is interacting, Yes, our posts are getting interactions in terms of shares, but who is liking the, the respective posts? Who is actually commenting? Because many times we have a lot of ghosts. Persons will see the individual posts and they won't interact at all. But when you go deeper into the actual analytics of your social media platforms, you're seeing you have a wide range, where it ranges from one to 2,000. But these persons, they're not interacting, but they're seeing the information. So that's very crucial to note that everyone that it, the, we have a reach. So persons are seeing the information, but how can we get them to interact? So from the Caribbean youth uh, environmental standpoint, we have persons reaching the um, different posts, but as with these interactions, there's not many. But in terms of posts that are actually like a flyer or a poster that consists of just words, we'll see little uh, interaction. But say, for example, we have a cleanup or we have a seminar where this the different posts consist of actual persons, then we actually have a lot of interactions, which is good. But when we have different environmental days and we want to shed awareness, how can we then get our youths, per se, to actually read the description, which is actually important to educate them in a different awareness? So 
a question for the youth that we have here how can we then engage you better in terms of the description yes it might be a little bit lengthy but the information is educational for your improvement as well very good point diana but the youth said they wanted to be catchy snappy visual video short punchy so we have to listen to the youths and what they are trending towards because if you're producing material that are lengthy and they are not um attractive it would just be one other thing that we post on our social media that has no hit whatsoever so yes no. i understand the place mm. for the lengthy information but there's also a place for the snaps and the shots and and, and so on no no there's a strategy to that and if the youth may um probably agree with this the hashtags and the acts and so forth. Now, you may have, for instance, a short video, right? Speaking about the importance of mangrove. Let's make it 30 seconds. However, you create a link now because you've already created, drawn the attention with that short video. Now they want more. This is where now you use the social media, you know, um, however you want to call it. Analytic, um, analytic. You understand right? well. Right. So you create that, you put the link below, and then, then they have all the information there. So the first step is to attract them. Use the short video, short clips, create, pique their interest, then they will find those links for further information. Great points, guys. Um, Delight. Yes. So great point, Adwin. Um, I just want to build on that. What I realize in my personal social media use is that when it comes to words and descriptions, I find it really catchy when the captions are actually on the, so if it's a read, it's actually on the read. So like you're um, doing a voiceover. So whatever the content may be, you could um, engage that way. So not having the words and the text in the caption, but actually on the video or actually saying it as the video is going on. That's something that I find really works. And since we're on the topic of social media, I realize that it in and of itself could be an entire job, mm. like managing all these different content, um, you know, timing for posting it, organizing the content. It is almost a full time job. So perhaps we could look at having persons delegated, like responsible for doing that, because by itself, it can take up a lot of time and learning how to like tailor these um, posts to the right audience and especially when you're communicating projects like big government projects sometimes that is something that um could be a bit overwhelming but by having somebody delegated to do that it could help Absolutely. and especially if that person is a young person they could actually you could capitalize tap in on that potential <laughs> great great points guys i want to raise the issue of um innovation and using tech ai uh, technology in pulling young people. There's a, there's a, there was a project that was funded by the Caribbean Biodiversity Fund, and it focused on mangrove restoration in Kingston, Jamaica. And they had the use of drones to monitor the area. And I asked them, why did you introduce drones? They said, to pull the young people. So we trained, they trained them in use of drone, and they had them collect all of the data how important it is to have tech and innovation in the space of building the capacity, engaging the next generation in environmental matters. Aria, your youths are there. Feel free to use this space. And anybody else who wants to go. Yes, sorry, we're having some problems. Um, um, tech and innovation is extremely important. And I give you an, a current example right here in St. Vincent and in Grandines. Currently, the Ministry of Agriculture has started um, the introduction of drones to use for the monitoring and evaluation and just the overall sustainable management of um, resources as it relates to agriculture and also aquaculture. And I've had the pleasure of interacting with the individuals who are part of the training and they were so enthused and they were so motivated to see that, you know, this technology can be used to give a wider scope and a wider understanding to make their jobs more easy and more science-based in terms of, you know, decision-making. 
Just imagine bringing more of that high technology within the classroom. Now with green engineering, the course is all about innovation and technology, especially in unit two, as the students go along, one of their, well, one of their tasks is to develop an SB that is innovative and that helps to solve an environmental and engineering problem. And we look at different ways in which you can incorporate renewables and so forth within designs in solving problems across St. Vincent and Grandines. But one of the biggest challenges is to have resources to make these things a bit more tangible for the students. And I just want to get the ideas of how important it is to bring innovation and technology for you and to assist you in assimilating some of this information. Absolutely. Um, Mark John said we need to create innovative strategies to capture the target audience, especially our young generation. Who has agreed and want to speak on that matter? Well, I believe Ariel was um, prompting some of our students to give some input since yes. they're really the... <laughs> so they're behaving I'll, shy. I'll, 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 I'll defer to Absolutely. the younger ones. Yes. How can we stimulate you with tech? What kind of tech do you require? To, to draw you. <laughs> what kind of technology you require to draw you in? <laughs> we okay, can so move on and come back then. Oh, Gabriel, yes. <laughs> well, yes, Gabriel. Um, it's normally the innovative part, right? With the designing of like solution for stuff, right? So instead of like get the technical technology, right? So what about like we have little competitions, right? In the school, right? Engaging the youths them to solve problems outside of actual schoolwork for maths to push the drive now. You understand what I mean? Yeah. I absolutely understand what you're saying and I, I endorse that. Um, how important do you think it is to have you in the planning process? Because if you have all these ideas, all these innovative techniques, how important is to have you sit down in these planning sessions? Don't be shy, Janessa. Um, it's very important. Yes, okay. Janessa will give up. <laughs> yes, please do. It's very important because we have a different perspective than the older generation so we can give our two cents and we can come to a middle ground an agreement on what works and what doesn't work absolutely thank you for that um Diana, sorry go ahead yes i just wanted to add um i am happy that you brought that in hayden because Oftentimes, youth or engaging the youth within the planning process is often seen as a last resort. If it's not a youth-led initiative, the youth are often engaged last minute. And to me, these young people are full of so much ideas and solutions. They are going to be the ones who are going to be driving the change. So having them at all levels, I think, no matter if it's a youth-led project or not, is very important if we're really talking about engaging young people to be environmental champions. They have to be there at the planning process for all aspects of project development and even program development as well. Ex absolutely. Um, Diana, I want I to ask a so question. in agreement. Yes, I want to okay. ask a question. Um, how involved is why CYEN in the work of SUSGREN and fisheries and um, uh, sustainable development unit and forestry. Are you invited to these events? Are you invited to get involved in their planning sessions? And how do you feel? Um, what do you think your position in terms of bringing youth? I didn't get the last part. How important it is to have the youth involved in all of these different pockets of um, discussions and the different ministries and sectors involving your organization because obviously you are you are a conjunct of youth who are vibrant and, and an involved environment uh yes uh within the caribbean youth environment network uh we consist of youths and we drive their potential as pertains to education in educating them in different respective skills so in the context of uh, saint vincent 
we do collaborate with the different uh, private sector and the other NGOs. We do different projects together in terms of um, it might be a beach cleanup or awareness um, campaign. Um, even recently, we would have collaborated together um, as it pertains to the sustainable development. We normally would collaborate for International Coastal Cleanup Day. And this is an international socioeconomic day where everyone comes out to clean our respective beaches. So the partnership is there and the collaboration is definitely necessary to be able to get each project uh, completed. And I just wanted to touch base a little bit on the um, innovation um, aspect for technology. Because I mean, with the innovation, it, it assists with our economic growth because this is um, a, a primary driver for um, fueling um, productivity. It um, enhances the quality of life. I mean, having stuff like chat GPT that uh, assists our youths to walk along as it pertains to problem solving. I mean, it will um, advance scientific um, advancements as well. So innovation has a lot of key aspects that will definitely improve our livelihood in the long run. Great. Thank you, Diana. Anybody has if, any other points on innovation? Well, I just wanted to add with regards to the involvement of youth, the engagement and so forth. This concept of using youth to reach youth um, methodology works from my experience in the sense that as of recent last year we we had students from the primary school on Uden island engage um teaching them about, about teaching them about coral restoration but myself and the manager miss christy shot we were there but the real leaders were the coral gardeners who we trained so because even myself, I'm giving a scenario where back in the days you're in school, you hear the city going to have somebody come in to give a speech. Now you're looking at this older person coming with these highfalutin words. And you know what I mean? Sometimes you just sit there and like, okay. So what we realize, well, okay, youth teaching youth, that engagement, in my opinion, and from our standpoint, really works because the interaction with these kids to these individuals who did the presentations and so forth was so overwhelming that... It's like they wanted to go beyond the time which we had to, um, to do this training with them. Beautiful. And this brings us to the next point. Um, Rudy Adams says, Mr. Willenji, given tourism plays a big part in the SVG economy, what is your organization doing, not mine, there, to combat sarcasm, weed, and help with the maintenance of beaches in the islands, not leaving it to the locals of each island to do so on their own maintenance? I know this is a very loaded question, but um, maybe we can talk about it as it regards to engaging youth in this particular initiative. Okay. Um, from a fishery standpoint, we do recognize that sargassum is one of the hot topics and is definitely a big issue for anyone who's involved with it in the marine sector. But the thing is, it's what we have been trying to do is figure out, you know, how do we best not just get rid of it, but live with it. And we would have been trying to see if we could have developed projects or slash ideas around not just the removal of the saga some but also finding some sort of alternative use for it so after it is collected how can we you know take it and and add some sort of value uh, add some sort of valorization valorization to it you know um but given the nature of it and that the fact that it affects you know so many different communities because of the fact that we're a small island state, so a lot of our communities are along the coast. You know, one of the things that we're very cognizant of is always to involve the communities in any different areas and, you know, see if we could try and tailor approaches for, you know, different areas because what might work for, um, let's say, those in the North Windward of mainland St. Vincent and Grenadines 
you know, would not necessarily work for those in Bekwe and Union Island. Thanks, Jeremy. Any other comments on that before I jump to the next point? Okay, so I'm jumping. Um, that brings us back to a few things that um, Aria mentioned about resource mobilization. How do we see the importance of resource, but how important it is to figure out financing mechanism for these sort of projects? Not only the sargasm, because that, of course, has such a wide gambit that we can think about. I mean, there are so, much, so many applications that are possible with sargasm, from building of shoe, shoe sole to, to um, plates um, to fuel and so many other applications. Yeah, bricks, paper, it's paper, a, extensive it's, list. Correct. There's an extensive list of things that we can do with sargasm. But let's talk about the resource mobilization aspect of it. Where can we find financing for these kind of projects? And, 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 and I want to um, preface this by saying that the Caribbean Biodiversity Fund um, has resources under a project that is now being pioneered, um, advancing circular economy. Um, that particularly um, will look at use of um, existing materials that we can use to either repair, recycle, refurbish, um, and even look at the use of sargasm as a potential resource um, for alternative use and alternative livelihoods. So let's talk about that for one, two minutes, and then we'll jump into empowering of youths. Holly Biner said, empower the youths by enabling and activating their autonomy. And I think this is a very valiant point because Arduin said, use the youths to reach the youths. But first of all, the first youth must be empowered. The floor is open. All right. Um, do, do we go back to the circular economy? Yes. Okay. All right. Um, all right. This is something that that I have put a lot of thought and, and time into in recent years, especially the sargassum issue. Um, in one of the earlier presentations, I think it was um, uh, Mrs. Matt Nichols from Sustainable Development. She mentioned a coastal um, plan, coastal and marine spatial plans and so on. And a part of that, um, those documents um, really speaks to um, projects which can utilize some of the things that we have, some, some of the resources that we have that are not necessarily tapped into. And one of, the, one of them that we, we highlighted in the coastal space was, of course, the sargassum. And you mentioned a long list of things that can be done with it. I think um, one of the things that I can propose um, is that um, at a larger scale, not necessarily through the funding for the small scale use, but as a larger scale. Maybe um, some of the things that can be considered would be to have persons bring in business plans um, that can be financed, whether from government or an NGO, uh, maybe or maybe from a multilateral funding agency, um, business plans that um, address these issues using things like Sargassum to develop some form of business that will not necessarily um, only provide a livelihood for the person who has developed it, but other persons in the neighboring communities and so on. And it is a type of um, resource that is ubiquitous. It's found everywhere, really and truly, in uh, in these times. So it's not limited to being applied in one space. So I think that is something that we could think of, because when you think of business plans, people tend to think mainly of, um, let's say, opening a store or, or, or starting some other type of that type of business. But there are environmental businesses that we can start. All right, that address some form of environmental um, issue. And again, um, one of the students at the community college earlier spoke about uh, um, solving uh, um, the different problems with different solutions. And uh, if we become very solution driven, I think that that is something that we have to move towards. And then how we finance the solutions, then we really have to think about that. But as long as we are solving um, some, some issue and we're thinking along that direction, and I think we will have a lot of answers in terms of how we engage you because I would say after having, and this is something I didn't mention earlier, but some of, most of you would know that I have taught for quite a few years. And one of the things you, you would, they are very perceptive in terms of um, detecting hypocrisy. <laughs> so if we're talking, talking about this and that and that, they'll be quick to say, but you're talking about this and you're doing that. So they will be very quick to say that. 
So if we're actually doing things that make a difference about um, the different things that we are speaking about, whatever it is, um, whether, whether it is resource management as we're speaking about here, or it is something related to climate change or whatever it is, or disaster risk reduction, or um, some other form of, um, of, of, of you know, environmental issue. As long as it's geared towards finding a, a practical solution, I think the youth will want to be involved in that. And I think that that is something that we need to really put more of our finance into, not necessarily documentation and documents as per se, but solution-driven work. Thanks, Alinson. Um, so we hear solution-driven work. Um, and don't forget also, in terms of financing, we've had uh, Mr. Van Bonhari who spoke earlier about the St. Vincent Conservation Fund. Um, that is one area where you can seek funding for that type of project. Also, there's this St. Vincent Environmental Fund. I think that's what it's called, Alanson. I'm not sure. Yes. 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 Absolutely. Um, um, I want to... I may just jump in here. Sure. <laughs> yes, there's the SVG Small Grants Program as well um, that right. is there to provide just. funding. But um, yes, just small grants program. But added to what Alanson stated um, in having this higher level financing mechanism, I think it's also important for us to package this in such a way um, that would attract our young people to be a part of. Um, I remember being a part of this initiative called Unleash, um, something that we can model right here in St. Vincent and Grenadines. So yes, there's seed funding provided after, but it's not just persons coming with their business plans and proposals, but within a few days, help or put students through the process of thinking about the system, identifying problems, coming up with the solutions, and then pitching that solution to maybe it could be a, a suite of investors or the different um, multilateral um, agreements or programs that we have here in St. Vincent. And they're just being able to fund some of those solutions. So I think there are models out there that we could definitely implement right here in St. Vincent and the Grandies. And maybe something we should definitely consider going forward. Absolutely. Why can't we think of, a, 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 I don't know, I'm thinking already. Why can't we think of some, some kind of fair where we could have people come in and brainstorm on solutions that they want to see happening? And then allowing um, the same process that you mentioned, uh, Aria, of building the capacity of these young people, helping them to write these things into, into yes. well, our sister's plans, business plan, but your same proposals. Um, to me, it's really the same thing, you know? Yes. <laughs> um, but we have to think about those things, Aria. When we do our um, knowledge fairs and our, our um, career fairs, we need to have a side event that looks yes. at brainstorming and solution-driven um, sort of approaches. Um, and see how we can have these ideas built into concepts and then proposals, and hopefully we can get these, these things funded. Definitely, definitely, I agree with you. Um, one of the activities that I had with my students last year, I mean, it wasn't on the syllabus, was just being able to map the system before developing the SBA topic. So looking at the assets, looking at the bigger problems, looking at the you know, problems and connections between the actors before coming up with their topic. I think we need to create more spaces for that sort of interaction. And um, just to add, we mentioned about proposal writing and young environmental professionals, but I think some of these skills could start, you know, being developed at the institutional or at the community level with young people, not just individuals coming out of university being able to write proposals. And Holly's comment about giving young people the autonomy and that empowerment, right? That has to start from there, giving them the skill set to develop these proposals. And maybe not, yes, I know some of the groups would have those capacity building workshops, but they're often a time that is inconvenient for the students, <laughs> right? And it should not just be just a select few. Okay, so that's just my last point on that. Absolutely, thank you. And maybe as multilateral organizations and funding organizations, we have to rethink the whole concept of proposals. I remember Jeff Small Grants one year sort of um, experimented with video proposals, and that was basically to accommodate those, uh, I don't know, far to reach um, indigenous groups who may not have the capacity to write a proposal but know exactly what they want to communicate and could do so through videos. 
So maybe we need to, we need to rethink the method of writing you know, this complex proposal and to look at maybe video proposals instead. Delight, in terms of empowering youths um, as the next, as the placeholders or the important um, component of environmental sustainability in the future, any thoughts and programs that we could use to, to, to drive this process along? I think one of the things that could help youth to develop themselves and also to contribute to their community is to really get involved in volunteerism in community groups. And even if they don't have that necessarily, they can also look at forming one themselves. Um, CYEN is a great opportunity for young people to get involved in. Um, there's also some digital ones that you can also tap into. So we're talking about social media, we're talking about networking, there are groups. I could speak from a marine um, standpoint, like the SOA, the um, Sustainable Ocean Alliance. There is a Caribbean chapter, there's also ECOP, um, Early Career Ocean Professional. So there's a lot of avenues for you to get involved in, even if it's not here physically. Um, online is a great, great tool to develop capacity and really touch base with others in the field and learn from them and get into, tap into these opportunities that are available for training, for capacity building. Yeah. Absolutely. Thanks, Elide. Um, Aria and your group, I, I see you um, there in discussion. Um, you want to interject at this moment? Yes. yes. Uh, for youth empowerment, I think to engage as well, uh, you could uh, have little events or uh, these little gatherings where you bring in youth and show them what exactly you do. And so this would help you to see, oh, I see you're doing this. I could see myself doing this or I have the ability to do this. So I would gain interest in doing it because we are not really, we don't have no insider in what you really do. So we don't know what's there for us to do. Great point. Great point. Yeah, I, I just wanted to add to that. One of my students, because I told them about the panel discussion, and, and as a class, we were discussing this. And um, Terence Providence, I'll give him his credit. He mentioned the fact that, you know, Miss, instead of us going for field trips, they could engage us before. I know that um, the different departments would have had activities with various schools. And while the presenters were going through, my students were saying that they cannot remember <laughs> a time where, you know, individuals came to their school and not just to talk, but to engage them in activities and, you know, things that are more tangible and relatable to them. Um, so maybe increasing that spread. I mean, as a lecturer, I am open to collaborating with anyone. <laughs> Even if you call me today and say, Mrs. Ferdinand, we have a project, we think this would work well for your students, I am more than willing to, to collaborate with institutions and CSOs and NGOs on that. Well, you've heard it. And, uh, and yes, sorry, Hayden. Um, yes, yeah, so even those are some of the activities and work that we on when have seen um, proven to attract more engagement from youth and empowerment because um, what Aria just mentioned and the students, sometimes, for instance, when we implemented the ecological farm, um, project to the French Embassy. What we first did is that, of course, Susquehanna is based in Union Island, but people hear about Susquehanna, the young ones hear about Susquehanna. So what we, trend, what we tend to do is that we give a brief overview of the organization, what we do, who we are, right? So they become aware, they understand, and then we get into the sessions and so forth. And again, very importantly, um, tangible benefits. You know, um, youth are very interested, just as any human being, in tangible benefits. Sometimes you bring these youth out and so forth, engage them and say in agricultural practices, but you just teach them the theory and they're not too much engaged in the practical. When a youth go out and they see they plant a tomato seed or a cucumber and they reap that and then they say, yeah, boy, let me go and sell, you know, they're selling it to, from the school standpoint to the, for, through the talk shop or whatever be the case. This is how we've seen the youth um, Peak their interest and their engagement as well. Absolutely. And Ari is saying, come to the college. That's what she's saying. Take yourself to the college and engage with the students so that they know what you're doing 
and you could create incentives that could get them even more excited about having you coming by. Um, Eddie Jones, sorry, Eddie James Adams said the pr proposal writing can take instructional approach. This is where the export can craft from one place, craft the instruction for writing the proposal in a way that persons can use to write the proposal in the, their own space and submit for check-in. So I think what he's saying is that there should be an iterative process where yes. it's, it's sent to us, uh, we review it, send it back to you, and build that capacity as it goes. Um, Jeff Small Grants is an excellent um, yes. model for that, where they mm -hmm. develop a concept, um, they build the proposal with you, and uh, and to the end, at uh, the end process. So very very good. And there was there was a there was a, there was a, um, a comment from Mark John. Twenty, can you put it back on the screen for me, please? Because uh, all right. I've caused a lot of young people out there have ideas and strategies, but they just need the guidance to make the ideas a reality. Yeah. Yeah. And that is absolutely the truth. Um, and it comes back to the important section on how do we incorporate all of these wonderful things we have said today in the school's curriculum? And is there a place for it in the school curriculum? Aria, I want to jump right with you and your students. <laughs> yes. Um, repeat that question for me, Hayden. So we have talked a lot about environmental sustainability, conservation. We talked about um, innovation and technology in that space. We talked about the empowering of youth. But how do we now incorporate all of these wonderful facets in the curriculum at our primary, secondary, and tertiary levels? And do you think there's a place for this in the curriculum? Oh, that's a loaded question. One that has been discussed um, numerous times. Um, I do believe there's a place within the curriculum. I know that one of the initiatives or one of the um, ways in which, especially at the primary level, teachers do is that they talk about these concepts within the specific subject areas such as science and maybe a little bit of social studies but i propose we can go further than that um i remember at the primary level we had this program the dare program um drug abuse resistance education program it was and every friday officers would come in and we had these activity books and would go through the different terminologies, go through some acting and dramatizing and went out in the field and understand, you know, the different types of drugs, things that you could do to resist peer pressure and so forth. That could be translated into an environmental management or conservation sort of project that we can, I don't like to say project because projects have, you know, timelines, program. Yes, and that is one thing I forgot to mention. Develop a program around that. So using some of those lessons learned or those best practices that made their so successful in, in, in my understanding at the time, everyone was excited you know, to be a part, to have the, the officers come in and we learn and we go through our workbook. Have that translated to a program that caters around all the concepts and issues that we're talking about right here. So that we get away from this understanding that environmental conservation is, is a niche topic to be discussed only in sciences, but rather it's a way of life and creating behavioral change. So I think there's space for that. Um, at the community college level, I think beyond the curriculum within the classroom, I think the importance of after school activities can help to introduce some of those behavioral changes that we would like to see. I know Alanson Crookshan did an excellent job with the environmental club and the various projects that they would have um, completed here at the institution. And we're looking to revive that club again. So once more, we're not talking about these concepts and issues between the green engineering students or the environmental students or the geography students, but really to bring in all those students who are doing economics, who are doing fine arts, who are doing mathematics and chemistry, because really that is how we're going to bring about change. So having that youth-led 
movement outside of the formal curriculum, I think, is also important. And there's space for that, of course, with guidance from us and also NGOs and CSOs who want to collaborate with these youth organizations. I think that is important as well. Absolutely. Um, anyone wants to join in? Delight? Um, Jeremy? Yes, yeah, me, please. Um, so completely endorse everything that is that has been said. And as Aria said, it's a behavioral change is what we're looking for. And from you know my time here and personal experience, I think one of the things that we definitely need to do more is instead of coming and necessarily bringing the environment into the classroom, take them out and carry them into the environment. Because when they build the experiences, I can tell you that's what they remember. Because um, fisheries, we have like a summer program that we run every year. We also have an internship with uh, the technical college. And, you know, sometimes it's, it's just amazing to see that like in, for instance the summer school at the start of the week you're going to have some students like oh i i don't like fish i don't like this you don't understand what to, what fishing is about and the fishing industry and then we, we take them out we show them you know the impacts from the ridge to the reef we talk to them about different things we carry them out fishing and then before you know it, you realize that mindset start changing. So by the time you get to Friday, where they're um, usually to the wrap up, we would have them, you know, prepare some sort of dish. So they'll fillet their own fish and they'll, they'll cook it and they'll eat it, and you know, the Friday afternoon. And you know, as simple as it sounds, just that one week has such a large impact because sometimes you you see them after. Sometimes you walk in the street. So you remember me and all kind of thing. And, but, you know, and they will tell you about the impact that this summer school and these different experiences where we carry them here and there. But sometimes they're not going to necessarily remember, you know, all the different things you said about coral reef and fish. But they remember the experience. They remember how they felt, you know, and that, you know, they now learn something, this is important and this need to be safeguarded. So in a sense, you know, it kind of builds stewardship, right? And Absolutely. one thing that I really have to say is that in all of this, when we're looking at how we're going to try and bring about this change in mindset and behavior, when we're trying to target the young people, we have to remember that what we're trying to do is a long game. And I'm glad that Aria um, shifted what she said and said, it's not about projects, it's about programs. So it's a long game approach. And sometimes I feel like, you know, we, we just look at short term stuff, like, okay, we do this thing one time or we do it two times, but in order to bring about what we really want to achieve, it's going to have to be on a longer time scale. 10, 15, 20 years, you know, if we are diligent, then we would see the real success, you know? Absolutely. Thank, Thank you. you, Jeremy. That is fantastic. We have to close, though. We have to close. Um, this is this has been such an, an amazing um, panel discussion, and the presentation this morning has been very insightful. And I'm telling you, we have a pantheon of wonderful environmental practitioners in St. Vincent and Grenadines, and we have to band together area and make a statement and effect change and build the capacity to engage the next generation of environmental champions. I'm so happy to have all of you here and especially having the students from the SVG Community College. Uh, it has been fantastic. Uh, at this point, I'm going to hand you over to the capable hands of Twani Barrow from National Parks to give the closing remarks. Sorry, the vote of thanks. And then we'll close. Thank you very much. Okay, so you guys are hearing me? Yes. 
Right, so a pleasant good afternoon to everyone. Yes, I was in the back and I must say I am really honored to be the one really spearheading this event. And I know that it was indeed a success. So it gives me great honor to deliver today's vote of thanks. So firstly, to our presenters, I know most of them are still with us. But we just want to say from the national parks, we would like to really thank you sincerely for your participation in today's virtual roundtable discussion. It has been an enlightening, I must say, and a productive session. And that is because of your valuable insight and contribution. So to all our presenters, thank you very much. To our panelists, and I see we have some of our, what I say, our students. Thank you, Aria. <laughs> so we want to say thank you for sharing your expertise. Thank you for engaging in, in, in the discourse. And we know that your perspective have had added depth and I would say breadth to us understanding and how us understanding how we can really engage and empower the next generation to become environmental champions. So thank you to our panelists and our students. Um, I just want to thank our co-hosts, our moderator, I wouldn't say our co-hosts, but our moderator today, Hayden Bilingi. Thank you so very much. You were exceptional um, this evening and you know your expertise and just your poise and everything that you did today made the event run smoothly and i think it was effective and i think it was very impactful so thank you hayden our presenters our panelists um and we really want to recognize the media houses they have supported this event api NBC Radio, we have One News St. Vincent, and all the other media houses. Thank you so very much. I know it was late, but you guys still supported, you still streamed and the event, and you made it accessible to a wider audience. And that is what we need because there are so many people that need to hear this. We we saw the interaction in the on Facebook and on YouTube, and we realized people want to hear the information, but sometimes it's just not accessible. So thank you to our media houses for your support. And they have been supporting national parks over the year, and we're honored to have you this evening. And finally, a big, big, big thank you to our audience. Thank you to those on Facebook. Thank you to those on YouTube for your active participation. We had a lot of questions. We had, you know, ideas. We had suggestions. Thank you so very much. Your presence and your engagement has been, have been instrumental in creating a dynamic and informative event. So I must say, I must say thank you to our audience. And, you know, as I close this event, well, the, the vote of thanks, that is. <laughs> we hope that this event, because we had some objectives, and we hope that we were truly able to inspire and empower and even mobilize the next generation to lead. We don't want them just to participate, but now they need to become leaders. So we want them to lead in environmental sustainability efforts, not only for the stakeholders, but also what we want them to become. We want them to become future environmental champions and advocates. And I think if we were able to do that today, then Hayden, we were successful. Absolutely. We were successful. So we thank you. We would, on behalf of National Parks, we thank you and all the other agencies. We really, truly thank you. And uh, we look forward to have more enlightening sessions in the future. Trust me, this is not the last time you will hear me calling. <laughs> and I know I have a good team of, of young people and I have a good team of the experts that we can definitely continue this discourse and we can have more students participating. And I heard that, you know, they would want us to come 
to their um, schools or take them even into our field of work in the environment and we are looking forward to i love it that is my passion so i am happy that i heard some of these coming out from our discussion and um this event was part of our national parks um month of activities most persons would have seen our flyers most persons would have seen um our um, activities and we have numerous activities um, that we have been doing throughout the month um, it's wait let me see if I can get it on the screen of course since to see yes so we had had a packed month of activities but we have some activities remaining um, we have our appreciation day which is on Monday for our staff we do have a planned sale from the 25th to the 30th all our plant lovers, and even if we have students who are plant lovers as well, you can come to the Botanical Garden from the 25th to the 30th, and you'll be able to get some of your plants and keep them in your home because we know how important trees and plants are for uh, the environment and also for us as, as humans. On the 29th is National Parks Free Entrance Day, where we uh, invite persons to go out, visit our parks, and you can enter for free. Um, but you obviously all the other um, services you will have to pay for. But it's just a day for persons to get out and to get, you know, get out into the nature and enjoy it. And that's what we want. We don't want just people just to go, but we want people to enjoy all the benefits that nature provides for us. And finally, we are inviting you to celebrate National Parks Day with us on the 31st of October. And we are going to have an exhibition right at the Kingston Post Office. And that is from 10 a.m. to 4 p.m. So we are inviting everyone, our, our audience, to be a part of, um, we're inviting you down and you can join us as well. So this is it for us. Thanks again to everyone who participated and those who are a part of our virtual audience. We thank you. Have a wonderful day and may God continue to bless you. And thank you, Twanik, for the Bye. vote of thanks. Um, I'll just uh, give my parting words. Um, I want to just commend all of you for your expertise. And I'm looking for environmental consultants that we can band together to work together. So I'm looking at people in front of me who I'm going to be calling. Um, but I want to use the word of Eddie James Adams to promote the idea of conception to realization. So we have spoken. We have um, given our two cents. We have made recommendations. Let us be able to engender the whole idea of conception to realization and hopefully that what would what we would have done today somehow would have started the idea of conception and now we have to take it to realization so thank you very much everybody and we wish you all the best thanks to holly holly say thank you everyone significant youth-led conversation bless be so i'll leave it to the words bless me have a great evening goodbye all right